Hey, it's me again, Amy. Last time we spoke, I had made a huge discovery. But before we get to that, let me just remind you how we got here. My father's death left me completely devastated. So mom suddenly convinced me to travel to take my mind off of it. But instead of having a good time, I accidentally got stranded on this exotic island that's owned by a native tribe who do not like foreigners. Luckily, I met Silas, who helped me survive here, and we actually have gotten pretty close. <laughs> We're having so much fun that for a second I forgot that I had to go back, until I heard the rumor that my accident could have been staged. Would my own mother really have caused me to end up here? I needed to go home immediately to find out, and Silas was willing to help with all his might, but it's been a few days, and I haven't heard anything back from him. I waited eagerly, then impatiently for him to come. Finally, one afternoon, I heard a noise outside. I quickly went down to check. To my surprise, it wasn't Silas. It was Nora, and as usual, she looked annoyed to see me. I tried to tell her Silas wasn't here, but she pushed past me anyway and grabbed a stick to draw something. What are you doing? Abstract art? There. Island. I see. People. Then I got it. There is an island? With people? Can we get there? Yes. Can. Go. We can take a boat there? She nodded again and signaled me to follow her. Oh my god! I jumped with excitement! Maybe I was wrong about her. Nora led me to the shore, where she uncovered a small boat hidden behind a bush. Go away! Now! Go! Go! Nora pulled me towards the boat, sat me down, and started pushing the boat towards the water. Isn't it a little late to sail now? Wind! Wind faster! As we reached the edge of the tide, I realized, Wait, I need to tell Silas I'm leaving! Nora immediately became frustrated. Silas! With Dad! Danger! I didn't quite believe her, but I also didn't know if I'd get another chance like this. I couldn't imagine leaving Silas behind without a goodbye. I felt a pit in my stomach, but we will meet again someday. Definitely. Our family has all the money to rescue him later. Just hang on a bit more, hun. I'll go get help. Nora kept pushing me, and she's right. The patrol could detect me at any moment, so I started paddling away. See you again, Silas. But I only managed to go for a few feet, and then it's like my boat got stuck on something. I turned around to see... Silas? What do you think you're doing? Hey! Nora said that there is an inhabited island nearby, and I didn't want to miss the chance. Get off the boat! It's too dark and too dangerous to go out there by yourself. I'll go and check it out first and come back by morning to let you know if it's safe. Stay here! I was confident in his sailing ability, but it seemed Nora wasn't. She ran to cling to his arm, begging him not to go. Still, he ignored her and got on the boat. Nora glared at me before storming off, but I stayed on the shore for a moment, watching Silas disappear into the dark sea. Soon enough, the winds grew stronger and the rain started coming down hard. The storm lasted through the night. I stayed up, waiting in the cave where I spent my first night on the island. The rain stopped by dawn. I couldn't sit still and kept marching back and forth along the shore looking for any signs of Silas. Nora returned soon after, yelling at me in her native tongue. I didn't understand anything she was saying, but I knew she was just as worried for Silas as I was. He'll be back soon, safe and sound. I trust him. And moments later, there he really was, coming back to shore. I couldn't help but run up and hug him as soon as he stepped out of the boat. I asked if he was okay and how he dealt with the rain, and Silas answered all of my questions with a tight hug. But soon we were interrupted by Nora. She shouted angrily and then stormed off. Silas chased after her and said some things that seemed to calm her down. That island is actually your family's gem mine. I've let them know that their boss lady is alive and well and ready to go home. Oh my god, really? They have their ship ready just a bit further offshore since it's dangerous to get close to the island, you know. Just sail out a little bit and they'll pick you right up. Yay! I'm finally leaving! We're finally... Silas stopped walking and looked at me sadly. Come on, let's go! I can't go with you. Nora will only let you go peacefully if I stay here. If I try to leave with you, she'll tell her father. My heart sank. We'll see each other again, I promise. How? Where there's a will, there's a way. Silas squeezed my hand and then let me go. I tried not to look back at him as I got onto the boat and set sail. I traveled for what could have been a few minutes, or a few hours. I couldn't tell anymore, until I was finally spotted by a larger vessel. They set out a lifeboat for me, and once on board, I was well taken care of by everyone. Offered food and warm clothes. But first thing first, I had to contact my family. I called home, and the person on the other end was my grandmother. She's as surprised to hear my voice as me hearing hers. Turns out, after all the shenanigans that happened after my father's death, my grandma had moved into our house to take care of things and wait for my return. We cried for a good ten minutes, and then I told her not to worry. I was safe, and that I'd be home soon. 
When I got home, Grandma, Nanny Emma, and my sister Briona rushed to greet me. As my sister hugged me tightly, I realized how much I had truly missed them, and also realized that my mom was really nowhere to be seen. No one made any mention of her in any way. I worked up the nerve to ask my grandma about her. Right when the police said there were signs of foul play in your disappearance, I already got suspicious. Then when Emma said it was your mother who suggested you go there and play those silly games, I immediately kicked her out. People are truly full of surprises. Do you really think Mom was masterminding all this? She was really trying to get both of you. Briona was lucky she forgot her passport. Don't be glum, dear. You still have me, and Briona and Emma, too. We all love you and care about you very much. Now, go have some rest. It must have been a long journey for you. The next day, as soon as I got up, I went looking for my sister to confirm the things Grandma had said. When I found her, I couldn't stop the tears from spilling out. How could Mom have been the one to do this? Why would she do something like this to her own children? Amy, never listen to a story from one side only. Huh? Do you know something I don't know? Just don't jump into conclusions yet. She then excused herself to work and hurriedly left before I could ask anything else. I kept thinking about what Briona said, but couldn't come up with any other speculation. As I passed my parents' room, I noticed a box sitting outside the door. It's full of my mother's belongings. Nanny Emma is probably packing my mom's stuff out of here. Something in the box caught my eye. I opened it up and found that it was a photo album of me since I was a kid. And next to each picture is some love notes. This is definitely my mom's handwriting. My eyes landed on a photo of myself playing the piano. And my mother wrote, Sweet Pea playing my favorite song. She meant so well, but I was always the ungrateful, rebellious one. Was that why she stopped loving me? Did I do anything that terrible for her to want me gone? I suddenly missed her. I found myself taking the photo up to the piano room, some place I've never gone voluntarily. But as I reached for the doorknob, I heard voices coming from the inside. I peeked through the ajar door. Stop it. It's lucky enough that you didn't get caught. Just get out of here before it's too late. And throw all of my effort in vain? No way! My plan was going so well. How on earth could she survive? So, plan B. You need to secure that spot in the board of directors before Amy gets in the way, and I'll take care of the rest. But, oh god, them? They were behind all this? That night... I waited until I had everyone together to make an exciting announcement. Tomorrow, I'm officially going to start working for the company. I've been working on a proposal to pitch to the board of directors to gain their approval. That's wonderful, dear. Don't you think you need some sort of rest, sweetheart? You went through a big ordeal and... I'm ready. I'm totally fine. Well, Briona will also be returning to the company, and I'm glad I'll be able to help her out. The more hands, the better. I'm so glad you want to join the company. Later that evening, Nanny came into my room with a warm glass of milk. Oh, Emma, you always take such good care of me. Well, tomorrow's going to be a big day, and you need to get a good night's rest. Thank you. Finish your milk before it gets cold, sweetie. Good night. I hugged the warm milk glass and smiled at her as she walked out. Okay, one last revision and then I'll go prepare my outfit for tomorrow. But my eyes, so tired. Suddenly, I was woken up by a sound at the door. Then it slowly opened, followed by footsteps. Someone is walking towards me. She's looking for my documents. Aha! Time to wrap up your play, Emma. Oh, sweetie, go to sleep properly in bed. I'll, I'll help you tidy up. Cut the act, you witch. What do you think you're going to find here? My presentation for tomorrow? Joke's on you. It's a trap. But the milk, you've drank it all. You mean the glass of milk-flavored hypnotic? I've poured it down the drain. Sorry. Suddenly felt lactose intolerant. Bold of you to think you can fool me in my own house. I've seen everything. But why do you want to take me down that bad? Emma, aren't we? Because my daughter, Briona, deserves this company more than you. Before I could even process that information, Emma was rushing towards me holding a chloroform-soaked rag. Just as she backed me into a corner, the door flew open. My grandma and Briona rushed in, followed by the police, who restrained Emma right away. Briona ran over yelling, I told you I didn't want any part in your schemes. I would never, ever hurt my sister. Briona? Did you know she was your real mother already? Not until after mom was gone. Then Emma told me everything. Sensing my confusion, Briona explained that Emma had a fling with our father many years ago, but he wouldn't marry her because of her lesser status. She was already pregnant with Briona at the time, so our father allowed her to stay as a nanny. When my mom married our dad, she only knew that Briona was her husband's stepchild. I'm sorry I didn't come clean sooner. I didn't know what to do. 
because I didn't realize how far she was willing to go. But when I saw her messing with your drink, I knew that I needed to at least warn you. Thank you for always being on my side and telling the truth now. It must have been even harder for you to process all these. But don't worry, we can still make this right. Emma was trying to explain away her crimes as the police escorted her away in handcuffs. They assured as justice would be served. We got in touch with mom, and by morning she was back home. After some more crying and apologizing and explaining and hugging, everything was as close to normal as it could be. I admitted that I didn't want the responsibility of running the company, but there was something I did want. I wanted to return to the Gem Island and oversee the exploration of the new mines. What I didn't say was the reason I really wanted to return. He was all I could think about as I embarked on my journey back to the island. We took a big boat as far as we could, before I needed to board a paddle boat to remain undetected once we reached native territory. Before I knew it, the island appeared on the horizon. My heart fluttered as I paddled faster and faster, waiting for the moment I could finally see Silas again. I was so focused on the land ahead that I didn't see the huge wave coming up from behind and overturned my boat. When I opened my eyes, I once again thought I was dead. This time, it was because the first thing I saw was an angel's face. Silas? Amy. Hi. I told you we'd see each other again. <laughs> but my moment in heaven was interrupted by the tribe's return. We were surrounded by the natives hollering and pounding their spears into the ground. A man angrier and more distinctively dressed than the rest stepped forward. This must be the chief. He shouted something to the others, and they grew quiet. He shouted some more, and all of their spears were pointed at me and Silas. I looked up at Silas. His face didn't change. He hugged me even tighter. Just when I thought the end was near, I heard a familiar voice. Nora was standing in between us and her father, shouting desperately. The chief's expression softened, and after some discussion between them, the chief gave another order, which made Silas very surprised. So, yes... Thanks to Nora and all the good deeds that Silas has done for the tribe. They spared our lives, but they ordered us both to leave their territory right away. So Silas and I moved to the main island, where my family's gem mine is located. Here we still have the beauty and simplicity of the wild lifestyle, while being connected to the rest of the world and helping manage our family business. So it's okay that we're not allowed to stay on the tribe's island. Not to mention, we still have a friend who often comes to visit. Nora had nagged her father to allow her to come over to our island every few days. It was at first because of Silas, but I think that she has set her sights on someone new now. <laughs> I was skipping to the kitchen to see the apple bag Dad had prepared for my school picnic. Aww, how thoughtful of him. I excitedly took a bite, but it tasted like it had been left to rot for a decade. I frantically checked the bag and saw this was not the only bad one. Dad! Hey, I'm Doris, and things like this are an everyday occurrence for me. My dad's clumsy and colorblind, two contributing factors that sure make life interesting. Since mom passed away, I had to watch him like a hawk, else you betcha he'd mess stuff up. One time he roasted a turkey, but it was so raw as if it would jump off the plate and run around the house. And on my last birthday, he got me a pair of mittens with one bright orange and one neon green. I reluctantly tried them on, looking like a clown while people burst out laughing. Despite all that, he's still an awesome dad in my eyes. A super talented artist with incredible artwork, provided he lets me label the paint colors. And also a really big supporter of my dream. From the first time he helped me skate on the lake, I knew it was my life's calling. If I can be an artist, even though I'm colorblind, how can just a few bumps stop you from being a figure skater? Bravo. I'll definitely give him a 100. Except that he does have one bonkers rule. No dating until I'm 18. Whatever. It's not like I gave boys much thought. The only boy I spoke to was my neighbor, Ben. And dad seemed to like him. That kid's pretty good. He likes drawing and artists are caring people. Just like me. <laughs> and he seems to not attract it to girls, either. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but it's true that we can never be a couple. His mushy manner is definitely not my type. Anyway, it's super fun having him as a friend. Since we were little, Ben always went along with anything I asked, from drawing me a unicorn picture from my room, giving me his only ice pop, to more exciting things, such as knocks and runs, and covering the neighbor's car in toilet paper. <laughs> And now, he always escorts me to my skating practice a few towns away, and just sits there scribbling something until I finish. This whole month I've been practicing so hard for the upcoming big competition in town. I'm gonna bring a medal home. 
This is my time to shine. I started gliding, letting the rhythm control my movement. The cold, calming breeze pushed against me like I was flying. It's time for an axle jump. I sprang into the air like a cotton ball, but suddenly lost my balance and fell flat on my face. As a result, I was ranked 29 out of 30. Duh. But surprisingly, there was one judge giving me all high marks. Finally, someone saw my potential. I was beaming when this cute guy approached me. Hi, I'm Luke. Just wanted to say that you were absolutely on point out there. Oh, he's that guy. I really want to get to know you more. How about we hang out together? I'll take you somewhere as special as you are to me. This is definitely against dad's rule, but oh boy, his killer smile made my stomach swoosh. So I ended up saying yes. I excitedly told Ben, but he gave me this sour face look. Hey, your dad will not be happy if he knows this. Just don't let him know. Luke is an expert, so he can help me hone in on my talent. You will keep this a secret, won't you? So here's my first date ever. Luke was so sweet. He complimented my ice skating and constantly gave me these loving looks. Our food arrived and delish. Bon appetit. I daintily tried the mashed potato and immediately felt the delicious taste of warm butter and chives and something pointy. A hairpin? I quickly stood up, demanding to see the manager, but Luke stopped me. Babe, you found the gift I prepared for you. Then he grabbed the hairpin and wiped it on his shirt and put it on my hair. <laughs> Maybe this was a normal thing for guys to do on dates, right? Only his gifts show didn't stop there. Later I found a ring in my steak, then a keychain in my salad. You're cute, just like this Lotso. Isn't he the bad guy? but the cherries on top were the movie tickets in my sandwich. Luke, what's this about? I just hope we could bond over watching movies together. You hate it that much? N no, no, I didn't mean that. Think about it. It was kinda weird, but also the sweetest thing that had ever happened to me. Luke had a funny way of showing it, but he made me feel special and giddy, and maybe in love? Before I could think straight, he was leaning closer to me. I closed my eyes and was ready for the most romantic kiss ever. But why were his lips so hard and unmoving? What? The menu? And holding it was... Dad? You know this crazy old man? I am her father. Then Dad dragged an extra chair over to our table, plopped down, and started babbling on. Then, when Luke wasn't looking, Dad poured pepper into his coffee. Before I could say anything, poor Luke took a sip and spat it out everywhere. Mm, sorry. I thought it was sugar. You see... I'm colorblind, so it was an honest mistake. After that, he accidentally splashed the sauce on Luke's shirt, then grabbed his glass of red wine and poured it over Luke, saying he was trying to clean it. Enough! Your old man is insane! No one will ever date you again! Then he stormed away. I was furious! How could Dad embarrass me like this? You're controlling, crazy, and do the stupidest things! You don't allow me to be me, and you just scared away my date! None of his apologies could move me. I had the right to make my own choices without dad interrupting and being ridiculous. So I used my savings and moved out of my home to start my new life. This freedom was greater than great. I could talk to any guy and go on as many dates as I wanted. Only, I know there's always were extra eyes on me. Do you get the feeling someone's watching us? No way. It's just you and me. I've had a great time. Do you want to do it again? Ugh! What the fudge? If Dad thinks he can stop me by messing around like this, he's totally wrong. It did quite the opposite instead. I started dating loads of guys, even if I didn't like them that much. It was so nice being spoiled by boys, and my room was always full of their presence. I updated Ben all about my dating stories, but he just frowned. Yo, slow down. You want to speed date the entire town? Man, it's just dating. It's not like I've agreed to be their girlfriend or anything. But you don't even know them. Or what their intentions are. My dad doesn't understand me. Why now you sound just like him? Fine. Don't feel like you need to come here or give me rides or anything. I can make my own way to school and get my date to come with me to practice from tomorrow. I'm sorry, Doris. Ignore me. I'm probably just overthinking stuff. Yeah. Ben's Ben. <sighs> He's still the one I could count on after all. Anyway, being a serial dater can cause troubles. I muddled up Gregory's interest with Ivan's. And I forgot I already told Anton my hilarious story the third time already. I was late for my date with Hector because my previous shift with Ryan went on longer than I expected. Then being so exhausted from all of this dating, I fell asleep during my meal with Christian. Luckily for me, Ben was always there to help. What's up? You look exhausted. 
I don't know. Dating was fun at first, but now it left me no time to rest, and now I can't even distinguish those guys. <laughs> hey, what's so funny? Nothing. It's just nice not having to share you with an alphabet of guys. Don't worry, you're the only B in my life. One day after school, a group of boys surrounded me and started accusing me of being a cheater. Hey, it wasn't like I was anyone's girlfriend, so it wasn't classed as cheating. I'm still single, so I can go on many dates as I can. Only, my outburst seemed to make them even angrier. As all these guys shouted at me, a cop walked over. Hang on, is that dad? Hey, hey, you boys stop bothering this young lady right now. I just finished a karate course already. I'll give you a piece of my mind. See? Hiya! Hiya! What a bunch of weirdos. Thank God Dad came here on time to save me. But it's such a shame that he saw I was a helpless failure at everything. So my shame became rage. Who asked you to show up in magazine? Quit bugging me with all of your nonsense. I can handle this myself. When I returned to my apartment, Ben was sitting there waiting for me. Overwhelmed with everything, I burst into tears. He pulled me into an embrace, and I instantly felt better. But then... Doris, stop with the games and just go home. Games? This isn't a game! This is my life! I deserve to live it how I want to! You're too much of a coward to ever understand that! As soon as I said it, I regretted it. Ben looked so hurt and mad. He just shook his head and left. I honestly thought he was the one person who would never leave. But whatever, I didn't need him, or dad either. Now I had to prove to dad that I was mature enough to handle independence and could find someone much better than Ben beside me. Just wait and see. Told you, now God bless me with this guy, Mark, a super strong and macho BF who was always ready to protect me. Babe, look out. What? Just let me handle this. Then he moved me out of the way and punched right to the wall. Wow, that's a mosquito. Thank you for saving me. One time, we were strolling through the school's garden when I spotted Ben. I immediately gave Mark a cute damsel in distress look and said, Babe, I'm so tired. I think I'm gonna pass out. Don't worry. I'll take you to the hospital. Suddenly, he lifted me over his shoulders and carried me off. My head was spinning, and it made me want to faint. Literally. I begged him to put me down and let me sit for a while. Then, I suddenly saw Ben frowning at me. Ha! Huh, seeing me totally fine without him, how can he not be annoyed? But who was that? She started staring at his art passionately. Then, can you believe it? She asked him to draw her, and he agreed! I can't stay here watching this ridiculous play. So I grabbed Mark's hand and pulled him away. But that night, I kept tossing and turning, and the image of Ben and that girl couldn't get out of my head. No, no, no big deal. They were just super irritating, that's all. Too many things happened, and now it's time for me to focus on my figure skating dreams again. With my sugar plum. As he went off to buy us some drinks, who should come over to me but my first date disaster, Luke? Oh, you're still ice skating. Just give up already. I only give you a high score so you date me. Don't flatter yourself. By the way, your crazy old man's still doing good. Shut up. My dad was right about you, you jerk. Jerk? Okay, this jerk will tell the rink manager to ban you from coming here for good. I stared at him, open mouth, not knowing what to say, when out of nowhere Ben appeared. I don't think the skating committee would be impressed by your fake scores, do you? All it would take is one email and you can kiss your position on the judging panel goodbye. How dare you! Then he left in anger. Right at that moment, Mark returned. Babe, skating sucks. Just quit it. Let's go for some trampoline then. Dars, go practice. No one dares to ban you now. Who the freak are you? Mark, stop! That's Ben, my friend. Uh, no, just an acquaintance. Dars, watch yourself with that guy. It's none of your business. Let's go, Mark. Bye, loser. The next day at school, I saw Ben with that girl again. My heart thumped in sadness, and I don't even know why. Maybe I was so used to having Ben around me, and honestly, I missed him a lot. Mark soon followed my gaze over to Ben. Isn't that the dude from the ice rink? Why are you gawping at him? He was lunging toward Ben right after. I grabbed his arm trying to stop him, but he pulled me away instead to a corner. You are my girl. Remember that. In front of me was a total stranger. Not the normal Mark I know. He was supposed to protect me, but now all I felt was scared. I couldn't move. Mark leaned over to kiss me, and I immediately blocked him. What? How dare you? Oh no, I'm screwed. Ah, uh, terrorizing your own girlfriend, I see. Nice. Ben? Right on time. You're so done with me. Then Mark grabbed a flower pot and charged at Ben, but I panickedly pushed him over before he could do anything with it. He stumbled about, mumbling something, when Ben's fist came out of nowhere. You, you, you want another punch? Mark waved his fist at him, but then turned around and hurried off. I stared at Ben. I couldn't believe my eyes. He was strong and protective, totally different from the soft Ben I knew all this time. 
Doris, I think it's time for you to go home. Have you ever wondered why your dad really did that? I... I... Ben was right. And the day's drama made me realize how much I miss dad. I wonder how he was doing. I arrived back to find dad sitting all alone, dozing off, amid a pile of mess. He was in stained clothes, and on the easel was an unfinished picture of... Me! With tear-stained eyes, I ran to him and held him tight. I'm so sorry for leaving. I thought I would be okay by myself, but I'm definitely not. I miss you. You're back. I miss you too, darling. I felt so bad for upsetting Dad. When I calmed down, we talked through our problems. Sweetie, I know. It's just hard. You're all I have left. I just worry you're too young to make the right decision and can't bear seeing these idiots hurt you. But Dad, I need experience to learn and grow too. Support me, will you? Um, of course. I always wish you can find a kind man who understands, supports you, and is always by your side, and makes you truly happy. All those qualities reminded me of someone. I kept chasing after trivial things out there, thus forgetting the one who was standing by me all the time. So I immediately went to find him. Hey, Ben. Oh, hey. You'll be pleased to know I've moved back in with Dad. Yeah, that is good news. Look, Ben, I'm sorry. I've been an idiot. I took you for granted, and now I feel very bad for this. I, um, was wondering if you'll take me to practice tomorrow? I'll think about it. And I didn't expect to see you confronting a tough guy like Mark. You're not just a timid arty type, are you? Who says I'm timid? I'm only like that when I'm with you, because it makes you happy. I'm actually fully capable of looking after myself. And, um, you. Hi, Melanie here, and I'm hanging on the edge of my seat to hear the results of this year's science fair. I know I might not look like a typical studious girl, but I'm definitely serious about school. Ooh, one second. The winner of West High Science Fair 2023 is Harry Silver. That means the runner-up is Melanie D'Angelo. Congratulations to you both. Please come onto the stage for your awards. Man, I can't believe I'm second to him again. We'd been literally swapping first and second place on every leaderboard since we were kids. Ugh, so unfair. Look at him. All he did was partying and pulling silly pranks, yet he's still on the honor roll, while I had to study day and night to maintain my straight A's. Mmm, mom's taking quite long. What's that commotion over there? This calls for a celebration. What do you guys think? Olive Garden? Yes! yes. Jeez, can you keep it down just a smidge? Come to think of it, people like Harry just have it all, while I only have mom by my side. Oh, she came just in time! Dad left us for another woman a while ago, so my mom had been struggling every day being a single mom. She must be really sad and lonely, so I'd never mention Dad anymore. Poor her. The more I felt for Mom, the angrier I was at Dad. Only my bestie, Izzy, knew about this, cause, you know, it's hard to open up when you're from a broken home. Luckily, there's one thing in this world that could raise my spirits, as well as my heartbeat, in these dark, gloomy days. My dreamy crush, Cameron. Last year of middle school was coming to an end, so I gotta make a move with Cameron fast. The problem was, every time I got close to him, that party pooper appeared out of nowhere to make fun of me. He kept calling me melanin, cause that's what you lack, and bothered me nonstop. We had never gotten along, but seriously, what's wrong with him lately? He picked on me way too much, and why only me? I can't believe everyone thinks he's a model student. To me, Harry's no more than the most annoying bug. All right. Hair, makeup, pearly white teeth, check. I'm giving it another go today, waiting for Cameron at his locker with my love letter in hand. As soon as I saw his gorgeous face, I took a deep breath and put up the sweetest smile, but all of a sudden, someone messed up my hair from behind. Ouch! I turned around to see the culprit. Harry, you look hot. And it generates electricity, too. Now you can charge your phone with your hair. Thank me later. <laughs> oh my god. Nobody should see this Medusa hairdo. My plan to confess failed again before it even started. All thanks to that clown Harry. Wait, isn't that my dad? He was walking out of the principal's office with a much younger woman and a boy my age. From what I gathered, they're saying that his son would go here. Seeing how my dad's starting a new life with his new family, I couldn't help but feel sorry for mom. This is all that woman's fault. If she just disappeared, things could go back to the way they were. But that's merely a wish, and me and mom just have to put up with this boring, unhappy life day by day. Voodoo for dummies? Was some higher power listening to me? This sounds like an answer to my problem. I ordered the book immediately.
I started studying all kinds of spells and rituals in it as soon as the package arrived. Voodoo dolls? Interesting. The next day, I went to find Izzy ASAP. Hey, I'm thinking of using a voodoo doll on my dad's new wife to bring my parents back together. What do you think? Does it really work? I don't think. Yo, Wednesday. Sorry. <clears throat> Yo, knock off Wednesday. <laughs> Harry Silver, you are so dead. But wait a second. You know what? We can test it out. Harry would be the perfect guinea pig. What? Him? He's just being his playful self. What if voodoo actually works? Harry doesn't deserve it. Well, I don't think so. Let's make a doll for our little preppy boy then. Crocheting a doll's easy. However, the tricky thing was getting my subject's hair, and you bet I won't get physically close to Harry even if someone pays me to. So I got this, a Ouija board. It will help me figure out the code for his locker. There must be a few strands stuck on the fancy hairbrush that he kept inside. Ugh, but none of the combos worked. This is the tenth time already. How about this? There we go. But there were only books inside. Ah, uh, boring. Then the soccer team's changing room it is. I will definitely find something on his uniform. Let's see. Harry, silver. There it is. Aha, gotcha. I was about to flee the scene when I suddenly saw a boy with only a towel around his waist. Ah! I sprinted to the door and dashed straight through the hallway. That was close. Okay, I still had a voodoo doll to finish. And it's done. I excitedly show Izzy last night's work. Pretty good, huh? It has Harry's hair, too. What? How do you know it's really Harry's? What if it's somebody else's? Well, I... I... Hey, did you hear some perv with panda eyes was creeping around the boys' changing room yesterday? Go away. But don't worry. Starting today, we'll take turns guarding the entrance to catch them. Oh, what a coincidence. You fit the culprit's description perfectly, melanin. But you're definitely not that pervy, are you? <laughs> I was so mad, I felt smoke coming out of my ears. I wish my gaze could kill that brat. Mel, you're squeezing the doll's arm. It's gonna come off. Whoops, my bad. Next time I saw Harry, he had bandages all over his right arm. Hang on, did I do that? Feeling guilty and curious, I approached him. Hey, what's wrong with your arm? It's been in pain since yesterday for no reason. My doctor said nothing's wrong, but I kept feeling like someone's squeezing it really hard. Ugh, there it goes again. Oh, spooky. It means the doll is truly magical. I immediately came running to tell Izzy, and of course, she was shocked too. But hold up, nosy Artie? How long has he been standing here? This guy clearly had heard everything. He kept reaching for my doll. No way. He'd tell the whole school about it. Then suddenly, Harry sat down next to me. Melanie, my arm hurts. Feed me. Uh... What's he pulling now? Can't he see I'm in the middle of something? Right at that moment, Artie snatched my doll. Leave it to me. No, Artie, no! Not with milk in his mouth. Oops, sorry, I felt so nauseous all of a sudden. That was more than enough to make all of us firm believers. But maybe I should stop. I do feel guilty for dragging Harry into this. That afternoon, when I was about to throw the doll in the trash can, I saw Cameron walk towards me. Did Christmas come early? Hey, I was wondering if you're... Yes, I've been waiting so long for this day. An occultist? What? I mean, Artie was going off about a voodoo doll of yours, so I thought you might know a thing or two about love spells. But if that's not true, I'm sorry. Um, what do you need a love spell for? Then he revealed he wanted to put a spell on his crush, Regina. So all this time, I had no chance with him at all? But hey, a love spell sounds like a brilliant idea. It could ensure my parents' reunion too. Sure thing, but I'll need your hair as well as Regina's. Also, some of your personal items for the spell to work. Obviously, I'll use his stuff, but in a love spell for me. And you know what I gave him? It's all junk with some of my poodle's fur. <laughs> a few days later, I found a gift box in my locker from Cameron. My spell worked. I'm about to have a boyfriend and reunite my family. But before I could carry out that long-awaited plan, Artie came to me with a difficult request, making a voodoo doll of Brad, some transfer student who already established himself as a vicious tough guy. That sounds dangerous, and I already promised myself not to use voodoo anymore. Don't believe me? See for yourself. Then, I followed him and witnessed another student being picked on by a much bigger guy. Hey, isn't he Dad's stepson? Okay, this Brad guy deserves it. So I agreed to help Artie. 
The next day, I approached Brad after class, where he usually messed with other students. I managed to sneak up behind him and get one strand of hair. Oh no. Busted. I quickly put the hair in the doll. This better work. Come on! Why isn't it working? And why now? Pesky little thing. Stop! Stop. I know those voices. Thank goodness. Touch her and you'll regret it. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call the police. Brad just scoffed and left. Phew, what are you both doing here? And Harry, I thought your arm hurt. Then Harry and Izzy finally told me that voodoo had never been effective. Izzy knew that Harry only picked on me because he liked me? That's why she tried to stop me from using voodoo on him. But she couldn't, so she then told Harry everything. To be honest, I found your attempts quite amusing, so I acted like they were successful to humor you and myself. I was gonna stop, though, but when you were being sweet to me and ask about my arm, I decided to keep it up. Oh. My. God. My bestie had been friends with my mortal enemy all along. Behind my back? Am I a joke to you? Why are you here? To make fun of me even more than you already did? Because I got worried when I heard you're going after Brad. Melanie, you're the smartest girl in school. I don't understand why you're doing all these dumb gimmicks. Yeah, you've been acting strange lately. Since when are you superstitious? What other choice do I have? Voodoo or at whatever cost? I need to get my parents back together. And that punk Brad is my dad's stepson. He deserves whatever comes to him for ruining my life. And you know what else? Both of you get out of my sight for good! Then I stormed off. After that day, I no longer talked to Izzy, and Harry's relentless pestering finally stopped. But honestly, it felt a bit empty without them, especially with the upcoming school field trip. Of course, I'm still coming. Who needs them anyway? This is the chance for Cameron and I to be closer now that we're talking on the regs. It's gonna be the best trip ever. I've never been the outdoorsy type, but does camping involve this many physical tasks? Almost done. What on earth is that? Isn't he under my love spell already? I mean, he even gave me a present. I was still in shock when Cameron came over to help with the tent. Thank you. No need to. I can't thank you enough. That spell of yours worked wonders. What does he mean by that? Then, out of nowhere, Izzy tapped on my shoulder. I've tried to tell you. Those two have been flirting for a while now. I guess Cameron just needed your spell as a little spiritual push. That means none of these has ever worked? There's absolutely no hope of bringing my family back? Feeling devastated, I burst into tears and ran off. I was running without looking and bumped into... Brad? Melanie, right? Just who I want to see. Or should I say, my dear stepsister, your mama sent you here. Let go of me and piss off. <laughs> I wonder how pathetic she had to be to have her husband walk out on her. <laughs> if this was any other time, I would have fought back. But after all that just happened, I've lost all of my will to do anything now. Out of the blue, I saw someone charge at Brad and land a brutal blow on his face. I said I'd make you regret touching her. I had to stop Harry before he messed Brad's face up beyond recognition. It's time we got out of here. Why did you come help me after everything I said? I'm kind of used to your coldness. Besides, my love language is following you around and teasing you until you notice or get mad at me. Silly. I know. On a different note, I thought you knew that voodoo was useless. Yeah, so I thought of a love spell to get my parents back together. Then my family will be whole and happy again. But I know it now. There's no such thing as magic. Why not? Magic is alive and well inside you, and it is called forgiving. It cannot punish those who hurt you and your loved ones, but it can help you let go of your pains and sufferings. What are you trying to say? I mean, no magic can make your dad come back, but someday the pain he caused you won't ache anymore. Eventually, your mom and you will heal and lead a fulfilling life without him. I never took this goofy guy for the philosophical and mature type, but I guess he's right. I'd been so caught up in my own bitterness that I didn't realize moving on was an option. When my mom picked me up, I decided to finally ask her about my dad. Unexpectedly, mom told me that of course it was sad at first, but she's actually doing fine these days. Life's supposed to have its ups and downs. As long as we welcome them with open arms, everything will turn out all right in the end. After all, your father will have the life he wants while we get on with our our lives. Turned out, I was the only one chasing the past all this time, when what I actually needed was closure. Mom's words were more than enough to put this grieving period behind me.
My last year as a middle schooler was quite eventful. Brad was no longer a problem since he got a taste of Harry's fist. Did I mention that we became a trio of best friends? For now, at least. Harry never stopped his shenanigans, but instead of getting annoyed like before, I found him quite adorable and endearing. Oh, just kiss already? Izzy! You are watching the incredible Barry's Blue. I'm Sonya, the super talented lead vocalist, and that guy over there rocking the guitar is Eric, my boyfriend. He's also our composer and backing vocalist. Yep, my man's good at everything, just like me. Actually, he's the one who discovered my vocal talent and helped me on my road to fame. Our debut album exploded onto the charts. And the rest is history. Eric asked me to be his girlfriend right on stage after our set. I don't know who was more excited, me or my adoring fans. Everything was perfect. And then our next album flopped. I guess all that pressure had interrupted Eric's writing process. I tried to send him positive energy. We had a big show coming up to debut our new single and start our comeback. Who knows when the sun will rise again, right? But during our performance, as Eric stepped back to give me the spotlight, I stepped forward and suddenly slipped and fell. S Sonia, your nose, it's crooked. I was rushed into surgery, but my nose looked like a lightning bolt. I can't look like this. I must be beautiful. You'll always be the cutest girl to me. No need to worry. We can still fix it. But right after that, the photo of my busted nose hit the headlines. I got ridiculed for praising natural beauty and then getting plastic surgery. What vultures! I had to upload the video of me slipping to end these rumors, but they claimed I did it on purpose to get attention. What on earth? We thought all that drama was finally over, but no. Right when my nose healed, my chubby pre-puberty secondary school photo appeared all over the internet, which sparked rumors about me having my whole body reconstructed. Some anonymous posts even made up that I was hot-tempered and snooty to band crew and waiting staff. I mean, maybe I could be a bit abrupt, but I was famous, so I was allowed to get what I wanted. Then, Let's Cancel Sonia began to circulate. Do these tragic people have nothing better to do than gossip about me? But my fans took notice, and a load of our tour tickets got cancelled. My manager freaked out and made me go on leave until the rumors died down. How ridiculous! Worse still, they were actually going to try to replace me? The beautiful, one-of-a-kind lead vocalist? How dare they do this to me? I am the band! Hang in there, babe. I promise I'll find a way to get you back. Obviously, my photos didn't leak themselves. Some jerk did this, and it's now my life mission to track them down and make them pay. Okay, so from my internet searching, I traced the original rumor to this group of my anti-fans. Can you believe they actually met up at this cafe once a month just to badmouth me? They even had a schedule. How ridiculous! What had I ever done to them? Disguising myself, I showed up to find out more clues. Hmm, inside were those terrible leaked pictures of me. Jeez, these people clearly had way too much time on their hands. Wait, this guy looks familiar. Is he... Owen? My high school crush? He was my senior in the music club and a super talented singer, guitarist, and composer. But how come he's my anti-fan? I never even spoke to him. The group buzzed about how pretentious I am. They even said Eric and I were fake dating just to cover up the news about our latest album flop. Ahem. Obviously, our love is real. I never tire of hearing trash talking about that Eric guy's songs. But it's closing time. If you posted about Barry's Blue, please claim your money from the counter before leaving. What? Owen actually paid them to slander my band? Why was he so intent on ruining my career? Did he have a personal vendetta against me? I just had to find my own way to figure all this out. Making myself one of them should do it. I immediately called to apply for the job. And I got it. Showtime. It's important to look the part. So I dressed up as this innocent looking girl for my first shift. Thanks to the magic of makeup, even I could hardly recognize myself. Call me Summer from now on. After the introduction, Owen immediately gave me tons of work. I had to do the heavy lifting and stinky, dirty work. I was a pampered star, not a grunt. Ugh, he's such an exploitive boss. I must have been crazy to have ever crushed on him. In the evening, the anti-fan group showed up again, followed by a familiar face. It's Rena? Owen's little sister. Back in high school, she was quite arrogant. It seemed like nothing had changed. Did you know that Sonya was such a weirdo in high school? Now that she's famous, she's acting like she's above everyone else. Stop right there, carrot hair. 
What's your name? Um, I'm Summer. So, Summer, here we've got a special requirement for every newbie. You have to pass the anti-fan test. Tell us, what do you think's the most irritating thing about Sonya? Ugh, now I have to defame myself? Actually, I was Sonya's childhood friend. Well, just a neighbor. She was the worst kid in the neighborhood. What did Sonya look like when she was young? And how was her personality? She was chubby and cruel to other kids. She threw bugs at them and never shared her toys. Take notes, guys. Remember to cite the source as Sonya's close neighbor. You can get some bonus, too, for contributing useful information like this. Was Rena also involved in this, along with her brother? When Rena left, the other anti-fans, Caleb, Violet, and June, still didn't leave, but turned to the stage and started tuning the instruments? What? They'd composed a whole song to mock me, not only about my surgery rumors, but also that I was a vain, hot-tempered, competitive, talentless, disrespectful, and never used my abundant money to help others. Their music was good, but the insolence killed their skills. I'm curious, why do people hate Sonya that much? She's rude and her music sucks. Yeah, her natural voice is good, but it doesn't have any emotions. She probably doesn't know anything about love and doesn't have any friends either. Those comments from the anti-fans got me thinking. I suppose I do find it hard to open up to people, and I can be a bit hot-headed sometimes, but am I really that unlikable? Ugh, not the nose again, please! Huh? Owen? First you break the cups, now you're wasting sugar. Sugar? Seriously? Aren't you even going to ask if I'm hurt? If I leave here with just a scratch, this place will be finished, you know. This place was fine until you showed up. At least, Summer, you should learn how to apologize and thank. Suddenly, the anti-fan's words echoed in my head. As Summer, Owen still saw how much of a diva I was. That means, as Sonya, I must have been so despicable. Um, I'm sorry. I should have thanked you for helping me. Hmm, that's okay. I'm glad you're not hurt. Don't forget Rena's reward at the counter. Take it before you go. Why do you have to pay others to badmouth Sonya? I'm only going along with all this for my sister, but it brings more customers in, so whatever. So the person behind this is Rena? I don't think so. Someone must be pulling her strings. But who? I don't know. Why are you so concerned, Summer? I was just curious. <laughs> I used to think badly about Owen, but beneath his cold front, he's kind of sweet and caring. Just like years ago. I was trying to escape the rain and bumped into him. He saved me from falling. Didn't care how sweaty I was and even gave me his umbrella. But in front of my crush, I was too shy and embarrassed to say anything and hurried off. Since then, I didn't feel so uncomfortable hearing the anti-fans slate me and our band's decline. It was almost all true anyway. At least this way, I could learn from my past mistakes and become a way better person. Flowers grow in the strangest of places, right? Yeah. These anti-fans actually became my friends. Playing with them was way more fun than with the berries somehow. Okay guys, you need to share your music with the world. So, I signed up our budding band for a local music competition. Well, what? But we're not professionals. Do you really think we can win? Who cares? I always wanted to perform on a big stage. But what are we gonna play? Use one of my songs if you want. I hear the payout is pretty good. Ooh, I love your songs. We practiced together every night, and everyone was so focused on this, they didn't post bad rumors about me anymore. Owen is truly a genius. Listening to him playing his intros always gave me goosebumps. And so, the image of a cute, talented Owen reappeared in my mind. Oh no. Wake up, Sonya. You already have a boyfriend. Eric? Speaking of Eric, he's been ignoring all of my calls. I get it. He's busy rehearsing for the show. But didn't he promise to find a way to bring me back? Oh, I see. You're too busy playing bands to post anything. We have a show this weekend. You started this, didn't you, Summer? I knew you were trouble from the beginning. Get out of here. I'm on her side. Are you going to kick me out too? Don't you see I'm doing this for you? Did you forget that Eric stole your songs and used them for his debut album? Rena, don't you think I already know what you're up to? You and that Eric guy are seeing each other, right? Doesn't he want you to spread rumors so he can replace Sonya, his current girlfriend? He says if I succeed... Her place in the band will be mine. An affair is one thing, but he can't help you shine with that tuneless music. That's why I need your songs. Owen, just give me a few and everything will go smoothly. At that moment, it all became clear. The only album that made a name for the berries was actually stolen. 
And worse still, the person behind my plummeting career was my own boyfriend. That jerk Eric craves fame and would never let himself get caught up in a love triangle scandal. You know how important public opinion is to him. He's using you, and as soon as you give him what he wants, he'll drop you without a thought. I'm not that easily replaceable. What do you mean, Summer? I'm sorry for lying about who I really am, but not everything is fake. I wish you could feel it. Pass my words to him. I'm out. And you, Rena? That jerk doesn't deserve any of our love or trust. Even if I didn't want to go back to being the famous Sonya, I couldn't continue to be the carefree Summer either. I didn't realize they were there. They must have heard everything. You're Sonya? Not Summer? All this time? You lied to us! I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you or trick you. Your words made me want to change myself for the better. And your music taught and inspired me a lot. Caleb, Violet, June, I just want to be friends with you. Who wants to be your friend, you liar? I may have found out the truth about myself and Eric, but now I've lost my career, my friends, my boss, everything. I made such a mess of everything, and I didn't know how to fix it. I don't deserve to be Sonya, or even Summer. It must be a delivery guy. I barely had the energy to get up and open the door. Standing in front of me was... Owen? Did he come all the way here just to see me? Some... Sonya. I've been thinking a lot about your band and Eric, and I realized that this isn't your fault. You can't let Eric win. You're too talented for that. If you show everyone your true self, I just know they'll love you. Actually, there's one thing I want to confess to you. I used to have a crush on you in high school, but you probably didn't even know I existed. Really? That's so dumb. What do you mean? Actually, at that time I liked you too. You were so cute and shy with that beautiful voice. But when I came closer to talk to you, you just ran away. If I had been more confident and braver, maybe we could have become something different. What about now? I mean, do you still want to sing my song? It'll be an honor. Your song is always special. Owen pulled me to the competition and tenderly strapped the bass on for me. Going out there without the rest of the band seemed terrifying, but we couldn't give up. Owen was about to lead me on stage when Rena rushed over to us and grabbed my arm. Sonia, I messed up. It's true that Eric was using me, and I had been so blind to trust him that much. I've corrected the misinformation about you. I was hugging her when the rest of the anti-fans appeared. I apologized to them how I was now a better version of myself because of them. Turns out we really like Summer, so we forgive you. Now we're ready to rock the night. You can't sing with them, Sonia. That song is supposed to be the theme song in our next album. Eric! It's Owen's song, not yours. And didn't Rena tell you that I no longer give a damn about your band? I did. Seems he wasn't listening. We've published your dirty plan all over the forums, so everyone can see what a jerk you are. No, you have to come with me. Tell them you made it all up. Leave her alone. I won't let you take anything from me again. My song or my girl. She's our friend now, so excuse us. We need to get on stage and perform our song. I can't believe I'm back on stage again. Only this time, it's so much better. My bandmates are awesome. The song is amazing, and the crowd is going wild. I saw Eric shamefully disappear through the crowd. Tough luck. That's what being a big slimy liar gets you. Toward the end of the song, Owen pulled me close to him and the crowd went silent. All I could hear was the beating of my heart when he gave me the best kiss ever. I was walking through the forest when a scream startled me. A man running in horror from a pack of wolves. I quickly howled at them, then crouched down. Distracted, the wolves stopped, left the guy, and cautiously sniffed their way over to me. Hey girl, run away! Shush! After deciding I was no threat, they wagged their tails and started licking my face. Are, aren't you scared? Not at all. People often misunderstand wolves. This isn't Little Red Riding Hood. They're not actually grandma eaters. Come and make new friends, buddy. Hi, my name's Winona, an 18-year-old Native American living on the Blackfeet Reservation with my mom. And I'm about to tell you the craziest story of my life. After the wolves left, I helped the guy find a place to clean his wound and told him more about the wolves. So you're a Blackfoot born and bred? It's my first time meeting a Native American. How about you? What brings you here, city boy? I'm actually a pianist wandering here for inspiration. Have you found it yet? Or did you almost lose yourself just then? <laughs> Inspiration's hard to find, especially when you're a theater pianist. A uh, what? A 
theater pianist. I work at Winter Garden. In New York? Wow, it's my dream to be a Broadway musical actress. Actually, my theater's looking for a stage crew. You could start from there and I'll find ways to introduce you to the right people. I couldn't let such a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity slide. But the thing is, my mom absolutely resents theater arts and forbids me to even mention it. So, I gotta devise a plan. I brought Luke home for lunch. Mom was so welcoming and even prepared a great banquet. So, Luke, right? What brings you to Montana? I'm doing a research paper for school. I'm, I'm in college. Oh, so you're around the same age as Winona. She's recently finished high school. I know, and if it wasn't for Winona, I'd be dead by now. So I was thinking, if it's okay with you, I'd like to invite her to college with me. That's nice of you. But what are you studying? Uh, hotel management. Mom, I thought I could give it a try too. But honey, you said you wanted to take a gap year. I just didn't want to try college alone. But now I've met Luke, it'll be different. Mrs. Ryder, I promise I'll take good care of her. Mom smiled, then nodded. Yes! Mission accomplished! Oh man, look at how crazy the streets of New York are. Thankfully, Luke arranged a small place just a few blocks away from the theater for me. And the following day, he landed me a staff member job to get me used to the theater scene first. It's not easy, especially working for a grumpy director with a zillion demands. Hey, you! Yes, you cleaning lady! Out of the way! But just being here this close to the stage is incredible, right? One day, on set for Mr. Killorn's new play, he started yelling and throwing papers everywhere. Curious, I picked up the script and saw a line written in Blackfoot. Ketsi kakumen? I love you? Mr. Killorn suddenly noticed me. Oops, I must have said it too loud. How did you learn to speak Blackfoot? My mom taught me. Oh, I live in the Blackfeet Reservation. Interesting. You know what? You're cast for the leading role in this play. Go and meet Jade, the coach, here at the theater studio. She'll instruct you further. I froze on the spot and couldn't believe what had just happened until Luke appeared, bowed to the director, and pulled me out of there. Am I finally living my dream now? Here it is, the studio from the business card. Huh? Are they shooing a coyote? This stupid guy was waving his umbrella at the snarling animal. I tried to tell everyone to back up, but no one heard my tiny voice until the guy next to me suddenly spoke up. Everyone, back up! Thank God people finally listened. I slowly advanced to the coyote, knelt, and offered my hand to him. When he seemed to trust me enough, I gently stroked his head and calmed him down. Just then, Mr. Killorn's assistant appeared and took the coyote in. Turned out, he's Mr. Killorn's pet. Who keeps a wild creature as a pet in this stuffy, urban space? You okay? You hurt anywhere? I'm fine. The poor little coyote looked terrified. You know a lot about animals, don't you? I grew up with them, yeah. In Blackfoot mythology, coyotes are guardian spirits. Well, you sure were a guardian spirit right then. I was still so touched by his words, but then Luke suddenly appeared. Winona, I just heard about what happened. You okay? What are you doing here? The guy, who was friendly just a second ago, now seemed cautious and just walked away while Luke glared at him. I'm fine. You should stay away from him. Hmm. Luke doesn't seem to like that guy. Something weird is going on between these two? I went and met Jade, our coach. She told me about the role and introduced me to Nathan, my actor partner, which happened to be the guy I just met. I couldn't help but grin and offered my hand to Nathan, but he just ignored me and turned to the script. Hello? Am I just a stranger danger now? We then tried the opening act, but since it was my first time being on a turntable, I took the wrong step and fell over. Nathan! I was blushing when he suddenly glanced at Luke and dropped me, almost kissing the floor. Right then, a girl barged in. Is everything ready for my set? You're late again, Stella. And actually, you and Winona are both gonna practice and we'll see who's right for the role. Winona who? As if this nobody can stroll in and try to steal my role? How snobby. She's lucky this nobody doesn't want to make a scene on her first day. During the break, I questioned Luke more on Stella. Stella is super talented. She's marvelous at dancing, singing, and acting. No surprise, though, because she's been training since she was little. That's exactly why we should just give her the role already. A waste of time dealing with amateurs. That was so rude. So much for ever thinking he was friendly. In the following weeks, I finally got a better grasp of my character. The female lead was a gentle, down-to-earth Blackfoot woman. 
Easy peasy. I just need to pretend to be my mom. <laughs> Only, my on-scene love interest Nathan was making things difficult. On stage, he refused to make eye contact with me, but he didn't have this trouble when he was up there with Stella. Every day I had lunch with Luke while Nathan and Stella were giggling in another corner, acting as if they were the most powerful couple here. Are they really in love? Oh, Winona, please. Why should you care? After lunch, I ignored Stella's glaring eyes and focused on being Nathan's lover on stage. What kind of singing is that? Give me a break already. That's enough, Stella. Actually, I just informed Mr. Killorn over lunch that Winona's getting the role. Ha! Huh, very funny! No, it's not a joke. Look at your performance recently, Stella. It's rather disappointing. Winona, keep up the good work. Stella looked like she'd had the blood sucked out of her. I excitedly beamed at Luke. But strangely, he looked concerned and ran after Stella. Does he have feelings for her? See that? Why hasn't he just confessed his feelings for Stella already and stopped this unrequited love tragedy? Isn't it because you and Stella are together? And that's also why you're so half-hearted whenever you're on set with me? It's not like that. I just couldn't control myself every time our eyes met. What did he mean by that? Congrats, anyways. I always knew you deserved this role. He's right. I really worked super hard for this. I'm so close to achieving my dream now. The next day, I rushed into the first official rehearsal and acted my heart out in front of Mr. Killorn and the whole crew. I was dancing away to Luke's sentimental track when the door slammed open. It was, Mom! I can't believe you lied to me and came here to do these foolish antics! Oh no. Mr. Killorn turned pale while Jade gasped upon seeing Mom. I tried to tell Mom to let me finish this scene, but... Fine, be this way. Until you come to your senses, you're not my daughter anymore. Mom then stormed out of there. Mr. Killorn told everyone to take a break and also left. I stormed over to Luke and asked if he told my mom the truth. But right when he was stammering, Mr. Killorn came between us. I didn't know you had to lie to your mom to get here. Yeah, sadly. She knows about my acting dream, but she has always been so negative about it. Hmm, is that so? Well, you're doing a great job. Continue practicing for the play. And maybe take me to your mom sometime and I'll try and explain this to her. Encouraged by the director's feedback, the next day I confidently acted my part. Yet Jade seemed dissatisfied and criticized my movements, saying they were too rigid. Winona, I'm giving the role to Stella. You need more training. What? I'm not some toy you can throw back and forth. Was it all just a show to get me and her to pit against each other? What was that about? Why the change? You're not qualified. Go back to your mother. What has this to do with my mother? I didn't know what was going on, but I was sure of one thing. I needed to prove myself, so I stayed at the studio practicing, swinging, and swaying my soul away under the studio light until I accidentally sprained my ankle. Right then, Nathan came out and helped me up. Why are you still here? I saw you stay, so I thought I'd stick around for a little longer. As he spoke, he gently pressed an ice bag on my ankle. I felt the butterflies flapping in my stomach, but suddenly remembered his attitude before and pushed him away. Ready to stand up, just to fall into his embrace again. You must think I'm so hot and cold, but I just didn't want Luke to misunderstand anything. What do you mean? We're just friends. And what's up with you and Luke? Then he told me how he and Stella were the best of friends back at acting school until Luke appeared. Luke was instantly attracted to Stella and asked Nathan to set them up. Nathan, of course, happily agreed. However, the next day Stella suddenly expressed her feelings for Nathan right in front of Luke. Luke didn't take it too well and thought I was messing with him. He's resented me ever since. So, you and Stella are just friends? We are. Stella might appear childish, but she's good-natured. She's just... she's dealing with a lot inside. I've just been watching over her. But right now, she's gonna have to learn to stand on her own since I think I've met my guardian spirit. His guardian spirit? We were so close, I swear we were almost kissing. But I quickly pulled away, saying I gotta go practice. The final rehearsal is my only chance to get my role back now. I showed up just as a substitute today, but when everybody was ready to rehearse, the only person missing was Stella. No one seemed able to contact her, and the director was growing impatient. Jade had no other choice but to push me onto the stage. Luke didn't seem too happy with this replacement, and suddenly played the piano much faster than expected. Flustered, I took a deep breath and let myself float naturally to his rhythm. 
During the intermission, I asked Luke what that was about. Drop it, Winona. I already knew. You got in here all thanks to your director, Dad. Yet you fooled me with your little story. It's you who forced Stella away from her chosen role. Who's my dad? Mr. Killorn? Right then I was called for the next act. Still puzzled by what Luke said, I couldn't focus on my part with Nathan. Suddenly I heard Nathan scream my name and leapt to push me to the side. I fell on the floor and saw the massive chandelier land on Nathan. Everybody rushed to check on us, and among the crowd came, Mom? We were all waiting for the doctor to check on Nathan when Luke suddenly spoke out. I'm sorry for what I said, but Jade told me Mr. Killorn is your dad, and you guys forced Stella to drop her role. Mr. Killorn and I both gave Mom astounded eyes. Winona's my... my daughter? That's right, Andrew. But don't worry. As soon as Nathan's recovered, I'll bring Winona back home and will not bother you and Jade again. No, no, you've got it all wrong. Why didn't you tell me about our daughter? Jade said if I told you, she would harm Winona. Wait, does this have anything to do with the accident? Because right before the act, I saw Jade talking to a crew member who set up the stage for Nathan and Winona. I'll get this looked into at once. So, this play about Andrew and a Blackfoot woman falling in love, is it about you and Mom? Mr. Killorn didn't reply, but looked at Mom tenderly, and she burst out crying. Right then, the doctor came out, saying we could visit Nathan. Luke quickly pulled me aside, leaving the adults there. How are you feeling? Any discomfort? You're not mad at me anymore? Yeah, um, sorry for being a jerk. It's alright, dude. Go find Stella before she leaves. She said she was sick of being thrown around. She's taking a leave to reassess a few things. But why me? Aren't you? We're just friends. How many times do I have to tell you? Luke didn't even wait for Nathan to finish and rushed out of there. I wish them a happy ending. And it's indeed happy endings all round. Not only for Luke and Stella who are now officially an item, but also for Mom and Mr. Killorn. Or should I say, Dad? Our family has finally reunited. On the other hand, Jade vanished as soon as her schemes were out in the open. Turns out, all of this was because she'd been in love with my dad for years. So back when Mom was dating Dad, she told her lies about him to get her to leave. Furious that both Mom and I were back, she decided to make us go for good. Dad helped me get a spot in the theater academy in New York, but he misses Mom lots, so always makes excuses to bring me and Nathan back to Montana. You guys need more inspiration, right? New York's just all hustle and bustle. So, how about we move the studio back here? Nathan, what do you think? I don't know, but wherever you are, that's where I'll be. I arrived home in really good spirits after an exciting training session, and my mood took an instant nosedive to see my devious cousin Caitlin holding my diary. Oh wow, so your crush is Leo, the swimming club captain, huh? Give me it back. I wonder if the whole school knows yet. Don't worry, your devoted cousin is here to help. Thanks a lot, but I'll do it myself. Stop poking your big nose in my business. Hey, um, first, your nose is much bigger than mine. And second, about Leo, Leo, whatever. He'll be mine soon. Tit for tat. Payback for stealing my boyfriend. How ridiculous. And so not true. She should blame herself for having terrible taste in men instead. No thanks. I didn't want a player like him either. Hi, I'm Megan, the leader of the school scout club. I'm friendly, fun, and love going on adventures, just like my explorer dad. So, of course, girls like Caitlin don't scare me. From day one of my dear cousin moving in with us, it was clear we were never going to get on. I love to run around the garden and learn interesting survival tricks with my dad, while Caitlin can't even stand a speck of dirt. Oh my god! Billions of germs are attacking me! Get me sanitizer! No! And it didn't help at all that Caitlin's jerk of a boyfriend asked me out right after breaking up with her. Despite my clear disinterest in him, she blamed me. That's when we were officially like Cardi B and Nicki Minaj and the prank wars began. She drew on my face in permanent marker while I slept, stuck gum in my hair, and once she even tried to shave my eyebrows. But who am I, huh? I can beat her with only one move. But now, the stakes have been raised. She's going after Leo. So I need to confess my feelings to him ASAP before Caitlin butts in and ruins it. The perfect opportunity would be the upcoming school field trip for top students, which Caitlin definitely can't join. And there'll be plenty of chances for me to impress Leo. But there's one slight problem. It's by a river. OMG, 
Thinking of it made me want to pee my pants already. <clears throat> I have thalassophobia, which is an intense fear of large bodies of water. Of course, I keep this a secret, because no one will take me seriously as a scout leader if they find out about this. However, this is a once-in-a-lifetime deal, and no way can I just sit at home while Caitlin digs her claws into Leo. So, I signed up for the trip, and set up a master plan for it. Baby steps. I mean, literally. I signed up for swimming in a kid-friendly pool. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Oh, but why are my legs trembling like this? <laughs> it's not like I've morphed into a jellyfish or something. Look, the pool is turning into the scary ocean ready to swallow me! Help! Suddenly, a boy with a floaty bumped into me. I fell on my butt and my leg touched the water. Something grabbed me. Loch Ness Monster! It's eating me alive! Just then, a kid popped up and started laughing at me. It's okay, Megan. Happy thoughts. Think happy thoughts. Ah, this is much better. But then I felt splashes everywhere. I tried to avoid them but ended up toppling over and fell into the water. Panicking, I spluttered and flailed about. I couldn't care any less about everyone looking at me weirdly anymore and just screamed for dear life. Suddenly, strong arms pulled me out of the water. Then that guy carried me, and my face pressed right against his chest. Holy moly, it felt harder than a rock. You all right? Oh, my Superman. I'll be your Lois Lane. Ew, snot is streaming down your face. Disgusting. Gosh, this is so embarrassing. I got dressed at the speed of light and ran out of there. Um, hang on. Something isn't right. Hey, missing something? Jesus! This jerk still tried to embarrass me at the last minute? The only good guy in this world is my Leo! As if it's still not enough to call it a day, I came home to see Caitlin watching a scary movie about a giant shark. Sup? Scared of me already? It's not too late to cling onto my leg and beg! <laughs> Who's scared? This stupid show. It's obviously all CGI. There's no shark in the world that could be that big. <laughs> and, um, they're labeled as dangerous, indiscriminate killers. They eat anything in sight. But in fact, sharks are most often the victims. Whew. My acting was not so bad, was it? Finally, the field trip participants list was published. Of course, my name was on it. And Leo, too. But wait, why is Caitlin here? She's always wrapped up with boys instead of studying. And doesn't even remember the multiplication table. What? Can't accept the fact that I'm a genius, too? FYI, I am super quick at math. Really? So what is 356 plus 445? Easy. 234. Huh? That's not even close. But it was quick. See you on the trip. I'll be watching you, sis. The day finally came, and our tour guide is Mike, the best scout in the state. But hold on. Why does this guy look familiar? Oh, no. That's the guy who saved me at the pool. Scared that he'll expose me, I didn't know what to do but to give him the stupidest smile. To my surprise, he seemed not to remember me at all. Then he asked me to demonstrate the first activity with him, vertical neck climbing. It's time for me to shine. Eyes on me, Leo. Gosh, this guy climbed like a monkey. But don't expect me to accept a loss. I was enjoying the victory when Caitlin approached me. Everyone knows that muscle power is only to make up for a tiny brain. Yeah, great shout, Megan. Use all your energy up in one go just so you can show off. Are they cut from the same cloth? Never mind. Hmm, Leo's looking at me. His eyes are so dreamy. That was even more powerful than ten cans of monster drinks. Nature hunt, monkey bridge, Tarzan rope, all these challenges didn't make me break into a sweat. And Leo even came to praise me. That's incredible, Megan. How can you do that? Oh, Leo, I only had an apple for breakfast, so now I'm having hypoglycemia or something. I'm so dizzy. OMG, my dear cousin should really get an Oscar nomination for her fake act. I gave my sweetest smile and helped her. Just so, when Leo wasn't looking, I tripped her up, and she fell face first into a muddy puddle. Leo tried to wipe it off, but ended up turning her into a monkey. Then Mike walked past and said, Wow, this layer of makeup is a big improvement. His caddish tongue seemed not to leave anyone alone. In the afternoon, I took my free time to wander around and saw a pretty bird. Hmm, I wonder what it is. That's a red-capped mannequin. Very popular in Central American forests. Wow, good knowledge. Thanks for telling me without being asked. They have a signature dance to impress their mates. Any idea? A moonwalk that rivals Michael Jackson's. <laughs> Wait, what? 
Why did I laugh so hard? He might be funny, but he's still a jerk. The last activity of the day was using rocks to make fire, and I was paired with Leo. Thank you, universe. I squidged up close to him and offered him a mint. He happily took it, but then suddenly turned red and started choking. I leaped into action and hit him hard on his back, making the mint fly out. Leo immediately took my hand. My guardian angel, where have you been all my life? Anyway, would you like to join me for a walk later? I have something to tell you. Yes! Ooh, I mean, sure. Where do you want to go? The riverbank. Romantic, right? <laughs> R river? I'll die there. But so what? This is my chance. If I die, I'll die under the title of Leo's girlfriend. Totally worth it. I arrived to see Leo already waiting. His skin was glistening beneath the setting sunlight. Hmm, he was like my very own Edward Cullen, but it didn't make me any less scared. Oh, you're here. You look pale. Are you sick? Oh, no. No, I'm fine. Great. Let's get on the boat to enjoy the view. I closed my eyes tightly and squeezed Leo's hand. Then Leo kept talking, but I couldn't hear anything until... Megan, I've admired you for so long. Will you be my girlfriend? I turned into the ripest tomato, but managed to blurt out, I I'd love to. Gotcha! Gosh, why is Caitlin here? I was still in shock when Leo jumped out of the boat and... High-fived Caitlin? Then they kissed? Surprise! Surprise! Now you know how it feels to have your dream guy stolen away. No, no, please, I, I can't stand it. The water is scaring me. Just enjoy the view, Megan. Where's that fierce girl gone? Your mom told me that you have thalassophobia, but I didn't expect it to be so real. Don't worry, I'll show this to the whole school so they'll come rescue you. Good luck, cousin. Leo and Caitlin walked off holding hands. I stayed as still as I could in the unsteady boat. The world was spinning around me, but I couldn't do anything but cry. Time went by like a decade had passed. Then I felt a pat on my shoulder. Mike stretched out his hand, then swooped me up in his arms and carried me to the lawn nearby. But how did you find me? I saw the video Caitlin just posted, then immediately went to look for you along the riverbank. Is that so? How embarrassing. He kept silent for a while, then said, You might not know this, but I used to be freaked out by heights. My acrophobia is better now, but still. No way! You nailed the climbing challenge earlier. If you want to overcome your fear, then you have to find a way to face it. Be courageous. Don't let it become a weakness for others to laugh at. Then he gave me the sweetest smile, and right at that moment, he looked kind of different to me. More attractive. That night, I shut myself away in my tent while the others gathered around the bonfire. I wasn't ready to face anyone just yet, and my mind was too restless to sleep. The next morning came the boat race. When I arrived, all judging eyes were on me. I was nervous, but soon plucked up my courage and spoke out. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan, and I have thalassophobia. So, I can't complete this challenge. I'm embarrassed. Not about my phobia, but about letting myself live in fear of it. I love being a scout leader with all my heart, so I'll try to beat this. Fear is not your enemy, it is your motivation. Then I walked off to cheering and clapping. Back at the tent, I saw Mike waiting for me. That's the spirit. You're really brave and have the qualities of a true adventurer. Even when you're not in the game, you've already won the special prize in my heart. Everything went smoothly after the field trip. Even Caitlin stopped bothering me. She must be busy being lovey-dovey with her new love. Until one day, I saw her arrive home sobbing. What happened? That jerk Leo, he cheated on me with two, no, three girls at the same time. Excuse me? Why is my life so miserable? I know I can never outsmart you or be as brave, as confident as you, but do I not deserve at least one nice thing? I didn't know Caitlin had this self-deprecating side. Suddenly, I felt sorry for her. She is my cousin after all. Don't cry. I'll help you teach him a lesson. Really? Megan, I'm sorry for letting my jealousy turn me into a monster. Are we good? The next day at school, we stepped into the hallway and heard a horrified scream. It was Leo with his locker full of cockroaches. He freaked out so much that his friend had to catch him before he fell over. Oh, Leo, I am just warming up. I gathered my classmates and showed them the extra special gift I'd prepared for him. Hello, everyone. This time on Name a Cockroach After Your Ex, we have here a gentleman named Leo Whittemore. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone! 
Everyone burst out laughing and Leo literally fainted. And now he's known as Leo the Roach. Actually, this was all Mike's idea. So we can both retaliate against Leo and donate to the Cry Me a Cockroach Wildlife Fund. And back to me. To make things right, I decided to go back to where I started. I realized nothing is impossible when you believe in yourself and when you have a perfect companion to give you the gentle nudge you need. That's my dad, Marcus Baldwin, the world-famous jockey. Now he's the chairman of a super successful horse racing club. As his cherished only child, I was given everything I could ever dream of. But then something big happened that changed things. Before I tell you more, don't forget to like and subscribe. At the age of eight, I was in the playroom brushing my doll's hair when dad let this tatty looking woman and her daughter in. Audrey, I'd like you to meet Belinda and her mom. They're going to be staying here for a while and be our new mates. Belinda looked so frightened, so feeling bad for her, I took her hand and let her play with my dolls. We soon became the best of friends, and I even managed to persuade dad to let her attend the same school as me. Unsurprisingly, I grew up obsessed with horses and dreamed of becoming a famous jockey like dad. I practiced riding my horse, Jackal, every day after school, and we became quite the formidable team. Soon, I was winning a heap of junior contests, and even the newspapers predicted I'd be the next big name in the world of horse racing. This certainly helped my popularity at school, and I began a clique full of elite members. However, there was one slight problem. Due to Belinda's humble background, the other girls didn't get with her. Where did you get those shoes from? Your grandma? Did you let your grandma style your hair too? Come on, girls. Let's see if the canteen has any oat muffins left. Everything was practically perfect. And to put the cherry on top of the cake, I was invited to a gala event for talented young jockeys. I needed to look the part, so I got my driver to take me to the mall to find the most amazing outfit. But on the way, everything changed. I woke up in the hospital, wearing an ugly gown and feeling dizzy with confusion. Oh my, you're awake! Huh? Why am I here? Sweetie, you were in a car accident. You've been in a coma for the last two years. Two years? W what? No way! That meant I'd missed out on two whole years of my life and was now 17! I missed my own sweet 16! Once I got over the initial shock of being Sleeping Beauty, I made sure to ask the most important question. Is Jackal okay? Who won the Grand Youth Championship? After catching up with my parents, they told me something even more surprising. Audrey, you've been very poorly, and we thought we were going to lose you. You needed a new kidney, but we weren't matches. But Belinda was, and she donated you hers. We are so grateful to her that when her mom sadly passed away, we decided to adopt her. She's now your sister. I was sad to hear about Belinda's mom, but grateful for what Belinda did for me. I'd always seen her as my sister anyway. Right after I got discharged from the hospital, I was excited to get back to school and resume my life. Only, it seemed the world had moved on without me. No one dressed like me anymore, and I was stuck in a class with 15-year-olds. I tried to interact with them, so when I saw the teacher pinning up a picture of an elderly man, I asked if this was her grandpa. The whole class fell silent for a second, then suddenly exploded with laughter. It's the president, Audrey. Ugh, how was I supposed to know? At lunchtime, when I went to join my old friends, I overheard them talking. 2021 called. It wants its tennis skirt back. Hmm? What language is she speaking? Oh my god, Audrey is like an alien. She doesn't know anything. I mentioned the lucky girl syndrome trend, and she literally looked at me like a fish. Come on now. You know she can't help it. Let's go get some cheese fries. Anything you say, Belinda. <laughs> Belinda was on my side, right? Hmm. It kind of felt like she'd stepped right in and taken my place. At least my parents would be glad to have me home, right? Wrong. Mom was always shopping, attending yoga class and the spa, but she didn't ask me to go with her. Instead, she always asked Belinda. It felt like she'd forgotten that me, her real daughter, actually existed. Meanwhile, at the riding club, as I traipsed through the stables, I heard Dad talking to Belinda about an upcoming event. I'm so lucky you're here to help promote this event. I'd be lost without you. I no longer fit in at school at home, or at the horse racing club. Life has changed around me, and I felt frozen in time. <sighs> Worse still, I had to take this gross medicine. One time my maid was chasing me around the furniture, trying to make me take it, but I used ornaments, cushions, and books to block the path. I was so distracted making my obstacle course that I bumped straight into Douglas Barron, my dad's business partner. My, my. You certainly are a determined young lady. 
Later that evening, Dad called me into his office. I thought he was going to grumble at me for not taking my meds, but instead he said something I wasn't expecting. It seems that Douglas is rather impressed by you. He wants you to date his son, Damien. The firm's been under a lot of pressure recently, and having Douglas on side would be beneficial, especially as he's our biggest stakeholder. What? You want me to date a stranger just to help your business? I can revive the business myself without having to do that. I just need to win the horse racing tournament. No, it's too soon after the coma. You're not ready yet. Dating is the only way. Pfft. As if I was going to listen to dad. So I secretly came here with Belinda. I was about to saddle up Jackal, but then I got a whiff of horse manure and began to feel dizzy and nauseous. Dad suddenly showed up and took me to the hospital. Turns out, I'm allergic to horse manure. Ugh. Then Dad started yelling at me for training without his permission. Thankfully, Belinda informed me what was going on and told me about your allergy. Belinda? Why? Sorry, sis. I only told Dad as I'm worried about you. Whatever. I'm still going to horse race again. Actually, there's physical therapy, and if you pass the agility test, you could still get back to training. Dad, please. Fine. Do the therapy, but only if you go on this date with Damien. I agreed to go on the date, but I never said anything about being well-behaved on it. <laughs> so in order to prepare for our special date, I watched this tutorial video, How to Dress to Attract Men, a tutorial. Rule number one, make sure your hair is long and never put up. Rule number two, make sure to show a little skin, ladies. Rule number three, footwear should be dainty and delicate. And ta-da! As I showed up at the restaurant looking ridiculous, I instantly recognized this quirky guy from school, Damien. So I made sure I had the most unapproachable expression on my face. As soon as I sat down, I purposely ordered the weirdest food combo, ice cream hamburger. <laughs> I was convinced he'd think I was a lunatic and leave, but instead he reached over and tried a bite of my ice cream burger. Hmm, interesting. What? How could he like that? Someone please call the food police over here. Your fashion sense is so refreshing. Everything about you is fascinating. I am rather smitten. The rumors about him being quirky are definitely true. After the disastrous date with Damien, I met with Cooper, a medical student at the hospital who was helping me with my physical therapy. During the training, he was attentive and super encouraging. I was beginning to feel better, but then Damien showed up and insisted on staying there so he could check Cooper was doing his job properly. He wouldn't stop humming annoying tunes and munching on potato chips really loudly. Then at home afterward, he wouldn't leave and continued bugging me. When he finally left, I moaned to Belinda about how annoying he was. But to my surprise, she said she thought he was cute and funny? Hang on, does this mean Belinda likes Damien? On the day of the physical examination, I passed every single test without any mistakes. I was smiling as the doctor made his announcement. Miss Baldwin, I'm afraid you failed the assessment. I ran out of there and cried to myself. I felt someone sit next to me and was about to tell them to go away when I realized it was Cooper. Audrey, the improvements you've made are impressive. I was sure you'd pass. Seeing his caring face made me feel a little better. We talked some more and then he offered to drive me home. As we walked around the corner to the parking lot, we heard Belinda raising her voice with, The doctor! We stopped to listen. I'm not giving you more money! I already paid you for failing Audrey! Sign this so I can be sure you'll keep this a secret! What? How could Belinda betray me like this? Belinda, why? Why did you do this? You don't understand how hard it is living in your shadow. I love the horse riding club, but you're coming back and there will be no use for me there anymore. You ruined everything! Then she stormed off, leaving me standing there stunned. I immediately got home and told Dad what she'd done. I expected him to be on my side, but... I'm sure you're overthinking the situation. Besides, you should be grateful to Belinda. Not only did she save your life, but now she has agreed to marry Damien to save the company. Ugh! Belinda was only doing this to steal my life! It wouldn't work. I was more determined than ever to go back into horse riding and claim back my life. Mine! Meanwhile, Cooper helped find another doctor to test me, and this time I passed. I showed my results to Dad, and he finally allowed me to go back to training. But when I brought up Belinda bribing the doctor again, he just remained quiet. Am I even his daughter anymore? Okay, change of plan then. I met up with Damien to ask about his marriage with Belinda. So, did you agree to the marriage? No way! I don't want to marry whatever her name is. Great! I mean, that's sad. Well, my heart belongs to you. Hmm, how about we get payback on them and fake date? Just faking it though, if you don't mind. Fake? Real? If it means being your boyfriend, then I'll do it! 
So we immediately returned home, walked inside and linked arms and gave each other a lovey-dovey looks. Belinda's scrunched up face was a picture. I resumed horse riding practice and got around my allergy problems by using sachets and spraying perfume all over myself. It worked at first, but then I started getting allergic to the sachets too. Cooper immediately took notice and the next day he showed up with some homemade herbal sachets. Not only did they help cure my allergy, but they also had a calming effect on me. Without the allergy bothering me, I could focus on practicing, and soon I was back to my amazing former riding self again. I showcased my talents to the club and everyone seemed impressed. A talent like you should be head of the club. Yeah, I may not be a big talker like someone I know, but actions speak louder than words. Belinda was clearly jealous of my rise to success, so she pulled some mean pranks on me at school. One time she suddenly turned nice and offered me a coffee, but it turned out she had snuck hot sauce in it. I was so mad. I changed her ringtone to fart sounds and called her number. It was hilarious. <laughs> But then she suddenly fainted and was taken to the school infirmary. Oh, come on. She was so hurt she fainted. I told the other students she was faking it. But instead of listening to me, they all took Belinda's side. You're so ungrateful. Belinda even gave you her kidney, yet you scared her so much she fainted? Yeah, you wouldn't be here today without her. What kind of person are you? Feeling deflated and not listened to, I ran off. I stormed home and, on the way, bumped into Cooper. Unable to hold my emotions anymore, I burst into tears. He insisted we went for a walk, and I ended up spilling out everything to him. Hmm, I don't condone what Belinda did, but I kind of see it from her perspective. She's an orphan who longs for a family. She finally found her place in the world, and then you woke up and became a threat. I never thought of it like that before. I realized the best thing I could do was to stop the pointless revenge and put all my energy into my recovery. I stopped hanging around with my clique, then broke up with Damien. I trained hard at the club, but not for my dad or the company, but for myself. Belinda showed up and tried provoking me, but I just ignored her. All my hard work paid off, and I qualified for the tournament. At the tournament, I was leading the race and felt unstoppable. But then some bees started buzzing around Jackal's face. He freaked out and started bucking. Then everything went dark. I woke up in hospital feeling drowsy and saw someone rummaging in my bed. Belinda, what are you doing? Then Cooper appeared. Is this what you're after? I saw Belinda swap the sachets for pollen ones to attract the bees. I bet she also switched the ones before to worsen your allergies. What did I do to deserve this? It's so easy for you, isn't it? Because of you, I've lost everything! Belinda, how could you? Apologize to Audrey right now! No, I won't! This is all your fault! It's all my fault. Many years ago, I was in a relationship with Belinda's mom. We ended on amicable terms, but it was only in her final days that she told me the truth. Belinda is my daughter. I didn't want to upset anyone, so I kept it to myself. But then when you needed a kidney and Belinda ended up being a match, I used this as a reason to suggest adopting her. Then you woke up and we were so happy. I didn't realize how this had affected Belinda or you, Audrey. Please forgive me. I want to put it right. Mom and me were so shocked and Mom told him to go and find Belinda. After Dad left, Mom hugged me. Sweetie, both you and Belinda deserve warmth and love. I promise things will be better from now on. As I left the hospital the next day, I saw Belinda walking toward me. I'm so sorry. You've been nothing but good to me, and I was horrible. I was so worried about you when you were in the coma. But when you woke up, I got scared no one would want me anymore. I care about you, Audrey. You're my sister. I wrapped my arms around her. You've always been a sister to me, Belinda. But please, no more pranks. Then I saw Cooper walking over to me, holding a huge balloon. Looks like you have company. I'm glad you both made up. Here, I got you the- Finally, my first day at school has come. Yay! This special occasion called for my favorite hoodie. Super cool, right? <laughs> but then, out of nowhere, I was blocked by a group of boys and their cheesy pickup lines. No time for monkey business, but they wouldn't let me go. Hey, do you know who I am? I'm- Everything suddenly went blurry. Oh no, my glasses! I stumbled around trying to grab them back, but got shoved to the floor. Everyone scram. Give me that. I looked up and vaguely saw my hero offering me a hand. He gave me my glasses and I profusely thanked him. But he just gave me a cold look and walked off without saying a word. Strange. Oh, by the way, I'm Hazel Palmer, 17 years old. But I'm not here as a student but a teacher. Yes, you heard it right. Not to brag, but I'm kind of a genius. <laughs> I even got offered a position in my college's research project. 
which I have rejected to pursue my dream of becoming a high school teacher. So here I am on my very first day of fulfilling it. First, I was introduced to the other teachers, but unlike what I had in mind, they just threw me judgy looks. Luckily, after the meeting, a young teacher named Rebecca kindly welcomed me and even tipped me off about some of the rebels at school. Now time to meet my students. As soon as I finished my introduction, the whole class immediately turned into a beehive. Miss, how about we continue this lesson at the movies tonight? Mullet, Paris knows. This guy must be the notorious Lucas that Rebecca warned me about. Please, as if you'd date someone who would wear such a goofy hoodie. Yeah, who let a weeaboo teach here? Jeez, I didn't expect this reaction. I tried to restore the silence, but to no avail. Ugh, I'm out of patience. Quiet, or else you'll all get Fs. Thank God it worked. Whew, that'll show them who's in charge. But here comes another problem. No way! There's gotta be someone who's really here to study, right? Okay, who is our class's top student? Ethan! Ah, didn't he help me in the hallway? But it looked like he didn't recognize me. Okay, let's see. Ethan, right? Could you solve this equation? A equation? N no, equation. I suppose spelling is a bit hard for a numbers person like you. And the whole class burst into laughter. Jeez, this guy was unbelievable. Hmm, how about the second best student? Cassie Santago? That name sounded just like my old classmates. I turned to the corner where an arm reluctantly raised. Oh my, it's her! So good to see a familiar face here. But why is she avoiding me? That afternoon, while walking to my car, I saw Cassie and her friends picking on a girl. Upon seeing me, they immediately ran away, but I managed to catch Cassie. Cassie, since when did you become a mean girl? None of your business. Report me to the principal if you like. Then she strutted away, leaving me standing there confused. Since when had the sweet Cassie ended up on the dark side? Turned out, not long ago, Cassie's father passed away in an accident, leaving her to live with her stepmother. This must left her in so much grief that she put up this cold, reckless facade as a defense mechanism. That's so sad. So, to make Cassie feel included, and also to improve this whole class's performance, I came up with a master plan. More homework. Not finished? Minus points. And every lesson will come with a gift. A test during recess, and I asked Cassie and Ethan to help the other students. But when I called Cassie to the board, strangely, she couldn't do a simple equation. At first, I thought that it was just her being rebellious, but during the test that day, I noticed her copying Ethan's answers. Does that mean all her A's were from cheating? Not only that, the even shocker thing I found out was that Ethan was her stepbrother. After class, I came to talk to her, but she didn't pay me any attention. Cassie, I know the secret behind your A's. High scores mean nothing when they're not from your own hard work. But out of my business. <laughs> You're as much my friend as you are a proper teacher. I'd be pleased to tutor you. How about today? See you in the library after school. As if I care. Her words did hurt, but I guess she was just trying to keep her cold image. So I still waited for her, but she never showed up. No matter how much I tried, Cassie ignored me and kept cheating. During the midterm test, she even blatantly snatched Ethan's paper. It's true she's my friend, but I couldn't let it slide any longer, so I dismissed her test. That had to be done. <sighs> On the same day, while I was in the library searching for materials, I heard familiar voices talking. Ms. Palmer is way too much. She even dismissed Cassie's test today. Can you believe this? Why can't she be understanding like you? Cut her some slack, Sadie. She's just doing what she thinks is best. So that's what my students really thought of me? After everything I did to try and help them, yet all I got back was bad-mouthing? And Rebecca was so nice to defend me like that. No wonder they liked her. <sighs> a few days later, the unexpected happened. Cassie, Lucas, and a few others came and asked for extra lessons. Finally, they started to have another eye on studying. But little did I know that it's just a ruse for my dear students to turn the following days into a nightmare. And the instigator was Lucas, I supposed. One day, I almost fainted upon finding a huge ant nest inside my bag. The other day, my pants were stuck to the chair with some gum. <sighs> Fortunately, Ethan always showed up in time to help me. He's such a riddle. Unlike before, not only did he try to defend me in class, but he also helped me carry my textbooks. But I didn't expect him to care that much. One time, I saw him at the car wash where I worked part-time. I quickly hid behind a car, but Ethan just kept walking towards my wash box. I'm here to see you, so no need to hide. Let me give you a hand. After my shift, Ethan took me home. 
We talked a lot, and I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my mom's health condition and how I took this part-time job to cover her hospital fee. This side of him was far different from the normal, and it was heartwarming. Suddenly, we noticed an elderly lady who seemed lost, so we offered to take her home. And guess what? She's the grandma of the notorious Lucas. I was truly surprised by how much of a rebel like Lucas cared for his nana. I could tell he really loved her a lot. Poor boy. She's the only family he got now. Lucas, I know studying is not your thing, but have you thought about how happy your grandma would be if you at least tried? Since then, Lucas stopped causing me any mischief, and so did the other students. Now they could even do simple math themselves. Baby steps. <laughs> Seeing my effort finally bore fruit, I set up a parent meeting to report students' progress. Halfway through my presentation, a photo of me cosplaying as Sailor Moon popped up on the screen. Oh my god, why is it here? How dare you let this childish thing teach my kids? Then she stormed off, followed by everyone else. I thought I finally had my students on my side. Turns out I never did. Then came the last straw, my mom's medical test results. I couldn't help but cry, letting all my bottled up emotions out. Then, suddenly, a hand laid on my shoulder. What's wrong? My mom's health turned worse, and she needs an urgent operation. I'm sorry to hear that. It's all gonna be okay. Be strong, Miss Palmer. I appreciated him comforting me, and when I felt a bit better, we decided to leave. But the door was locked from the outside. It must have been a prank from my students. Again! We tried banging the door and screaming for help, but eventually gave up and waited for someone to come. This quiet atmosphere sure does have a way of making people open up, and I got to know about Ethan. Seemed like both of us have problems with our beloved family. What's yours? I... I have a sister. You know who. That I really adore. But no matter how hard I try, she always builds a wall between us. Oh, wasn't this the first time Ethan talked about his personal life? He always put on a cold and distant mask. But I knew deep down he had his struggles too. I was so absorbed in his story that I forgot about being locked up and gradually fell asleep. Until a buzzing sound startled me. And countless phone cameras were pointing at us. Guys, check your phones. Look what Miss Palmer and Ethan have been doing this whole time. Oh my! A bunch of photos of me and Ethan have been uploaded on the school website. And from some angles, it looked like we were kissing. Oh no! I tried to explain, but they just threw me a disgusted look. And why was Ethan just standing here saying nothing? This soon reached the principal. He told me there would be a case hearing for inappropriate relationship with a student. How was this even possible? As I dragged my feet to the principal's office, suddenly I heard familiar voices shouting. Why did you do that? I told you to find her weakness, and look what you got. Nothing. I've done everything I could. What else do you want? Everything? Then why is she still here? As long as she's around, she messes up our cheating stuff, and mom will get my head chewed off for being useless at school. Or is that what you want, brother? What? So Cassie had been pulling the strings this entire time? And Ethan was her puppet, befriending me just to please his sister. I knew she hated me, but did Ethan have to be so heartless too? Cassie then caught my eye, so I ran away. I was still trying to process this when I walked in to see the school council glaring at me. You're an insult to the teaching profession, which leaves us no choice. I was ready for the worst, when Ethan rushed in. Stop! It was me who deliberately jammed the classroom's lock to get back at her for being too strict, but I accidentally got stuck too. There's nothing going on between us. And so, I was cleared of all charges, and Ethan ended up in a week-long suspension. Why did he do that, after all? After such a long trial, I drove around town to blow off some steam, then saw Cassie fighting with a security guard. I found out that Cassie stole a bracelet and was refusing to call her parents. The guard said he'd have to call the cops, so I came forward as her teacher to bail her out. Cassie asked me why I helped her. But I didn't bother explaining myself and just left. Since that day, Cassie didn't attend the extra classes. After his suspension, Ethan returned with his offhand attitude. <sighs> no time to worry about those two. My mission now was to prepare my students for the upcoming finals and regain my prestige. Luckily, they started to take studying seriously and invested a lot in these tests. One day, when I walked into class, some students even asked me to help solve advanced exercises. Two weeks later, when the results came, my excited students all rushed over to me. 
Miss Palmer, thanks to you, the questions were the same as the ones you showed us the other day, so it only took us a blink to finish. What are they talking about? Before I could understand, the principal summoned me to his office. As I entered, he angrily showed me the math sheet that I was allegedly teaching in the extra class. What kind of work ethic allows leaking exam questions, Miss Palmer? Leak the test? Me? No! Please! No more excuses. You're fired. No, no! They can't punish me for something I didn't do. Someone must have framed me. I asked my students where they got that piece of paper, and they said it was already on the table when they came to class. So Cassie and Ethan must have been behind this. Good job, Ethan, for putting up their remorse act just to set up a bigger plan to humiliate me. Okay, then. They won. Unemployed and desperate, with hospital bills to cover, I had to work full-time at the car wash, as well as taking night shifts at 7-Eleven. But besides the measly wages was a bonus of rotten eggs and tomatoes, scornful looks and snarky comments saying I didn't deserve the teacher title. <sighs> the scandal truly turned my life upside down. Then, when I was at the hospital with my mom, suddenly Ethan rushed in and said he would clear my name. Clear my name? Wasn't he the one who put dirt on me? What was he playing this time? With nothing to lose, I reluctantly went with him. He led me to the school's control room. The principal was also there. Then I saw Sadie standing on stage. Ethan said it was her who discreetly put the math sheet on the table. What? But, Rebecca? I distributed the test like you said, but I'm scared. What if someone finds out? Don't worry, now that Miss Palmer's fired, who else can dig this up? I'm only taking back my position as the beloved teacher who can take cover for y'all. No, I have to tell the principal everything. Who would believe you? I would. Furious, I rushed over to the stage and confronted her. Rebecca, I thought you were my friend. How could you? Don't ask me. Ask your phony self. Weren't you just trying to get the students to like you? What nonsense was she saying? I'm just doing my part of being a good teacher. How could she be so selfish and cruel? Out of jealousy? Miss Palmer earned her students' respect with her pure heart. Look at you. The so-called love you have comes from buttering them up with all your lies. That's why they turn stubborn and make light of studying. I never knew you were that kind of person. How could you call yourself a teacher? The principal couldn't hide his rage, fired Rebecca, then apologized to me and offered me my job back. But after all these troubles, this school had completely drained me. I couldn't take it anymore, so I refused. As I was wiping away my tears, Ethan came to my side. Miss Palmer... I'm sorry for everything I did. I just tried to please Cassie, but now I know I was only hurting you. I've already known about that. I was about to leave when a group of students led by Cassie approached us. Then Ethan told me it was Cassie who helped him with the plan to bait Rebecca into admitting her actions. Sorry for all the horrible things I did to you. Please stay. We've learned a lot since you moved here. Please don't leave us. Such a crazy term. I ended up staying. I mean, this is my dream job after all, and I'm not one to give up that easily. I also talked to Cassie's stepmom about her studying. Turns out, she didn't realize her strict approach was causing a rift between them all. Cassie, Ethan, and their mom had a talk, and now they seem to understand each other better. I was so happy for them, and we became friends after that. Time flies, and now my students, or my friends, to be correct, graduated, and would soon fly off to pursue their own dreams. Suddenly... Ethan dragged me to a corner. So from now on, we're no longer teacher and student, right? I guess, but so... But could you still teach me? Teach me how to love you. I'm still waiting for the day my mom says, It's all fake. We're millionaires. This was just to teach you to be humble. But I know that'll never happen. And I'm still humble. But humble as in humble background. Hi, I'm Addison from Colorado. Ever since my dad passed away when I was seven, we've been broke. And mom got irked whenever I asked her for money. So going to this kind of expensive summer camp seems pretty far-fetched to me. Suddenly, somebody snatched the flyer out of my hands. It's Katie and Candace, the resident mean girls. Girls, are you ready for the trip yet? New hair, new nails, new clothes, all checked. What about you, Addie the baddie. Oops, sorry. We forgot that a poor loser like you could never afford to join in. I forced back tears as they burst out laughing, then left. Addison, are you okay? Don't listen to them. I can help. Stay away from me, Layla. 
Rich kids like you would never understand. I flicked her hand away and ran off. Hmm, let's see. Mom's getting ready for her night shift and didn't seem in such a bad mood. Maybe now is my chance to drop the question. Mom, I need some money for the school camp. It's the last chance to- We can barely afford the rent this month. Do you know that? Find a way to make money yourself instead of begging me, will you? At this age, and you're still so unthoughtful. Unthoughtful? Have you ever been thoughtful of me? I hate how freaking poor our family is. And more than anything else, I hate you. I ran straight to my room, packed a backpack, and quickly left the house. It's already 2 a.m., and this snowstorm is only getting worse. I ignored dozens of calls from Mom. There was no way I'd return to that house, ever. Oh, it's freezing. I rummaged through my backpack for my mittens when... Oh, Alice in Wonderland, my favorite book. The most beautiful moments in my life suddenly came rushing back to me. It was when my dad read me bedtime stories every night. I'd never forgotten his gentle eyes and warm voice. As I turned the pages in hopes of distracting myself from the storm, my phone notified another call from Mum. I have to tell her not to bother me anymore. Hang on, hospital? My mom had an accident at work? I quickly got on my bike to go there, but the barreling storm threw piles of snow against me. I couldn't see anything. Ah! <sighs> Is it morning already? Contrary to yesterday's blizzard, everything looks as fresh as spring now. But where am I? Suddenly, a giant acorn fell and broke in half in which there was a piece of paper. Welcome to Wonderland? Am I dreaming? Wake up, Addison. Mom needs you. Stop wasting time daydreaming like this. Just then, there was a shrill scream. Intruder! Restrain her! Suddenly, two strange men in uniform grabbed my arms, forced me over to a tiny rose arch, and made me go through it. I peered around feeling awestruck. I was in a huge greenhouse, and a well-dressed man was waiting for me. Hello? I'm Edward, the King of Wonderland. Welcome to my kingdom. Dad? Is that Dad? He looks so similar to my dad that I almost blurted it out. He welcomed me warmly with a table of lavish food. I hadn't eaten since last night, so I couldn't help but dig right in. Only when the clock chimed, I became aware of reality. Mom! I needed to get to her. I immediately asked King Edward for the exit. This land is beautiful, but a monster rules its gate. I don't know how you got here. But if you want to leave, you'll have to bring that monster three valuable items. Three items? I asked. Yes. Let's see what that is. Then Sir Edward approached the glass door and spoke out loud. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the most handsome of them all? Your Highness, you are the most handsome, the most elegant. We wish to be as perfect as you are. <laughs> yeah. If I was you... I'd wanna be me, too. Now tell me, in order for Addison to leave here, what are the required items? To escape this land, she must acquire one fair lock of Rapunzel's hair, the scarf of Red Riding Hood, and Aladdin's magic lamp. Complete this quest before the clock strikes midnight, or be stuck in this world for an eternity. What? Are you serious? Where am I meant to find those things? Don't worry, I'll send Arthur, my close bodyguard, to accompany you. Just then, a tall, handsome guy about my age appeared. Hey, little girl, there's no time to waste. We need to leave now. Then he threw me a set of clothes and told me to change. After that, we went through the same gate as before. Only this time, it no longer led to a red rose garden, but an underground sewer system. Ew, what are we doing down here? It stinks! Arthur didn't say a word and quickly found a staircase leading above ground. I immediately followed him, and there was a busy street right in front of me. I noticed that everyone was looking at something. It was long, blonde hair falling from a skyscraper's penthouse. Huh? Rapunzel lives in the Empire State Building? Ridiculous! We quickly walked over there, but it was guarded very strictly. How can we get in? That's why I told you to wear this. So, we easily blended in with the maids and waiters and entered the tower. Wow, I've never set foot in such a luxurious house. Who are you? Startled, I turned around to see Rapunzel in the Grimm's fairy tales, standing right in front of me. But wait, why does this girl look familiar? Layla, is that you? 
Oh, goodness. I knew you were rich, but I didn't expect you to live in such a beautiful house. You... you know me? I excitedly showed her our class photos. Layla seemed very interested in them, but she couldn't recall anything and kept asking me to tell her more stories about school. When I was rambling about our friends to her, Arthur turned to me and whispered, You need to carry on the task now. Oh, it's been two hours already. I chose my words carefully to ask her for a lock of hair, and of course, she said yes. But when we were about to leave, she clung on to me. Please stay here with me. Clothes, shoes, anything here you want, I can give it to you. This one? This one also. All of this luxury stuff will all be mine? Yes, of course. Wake up. Have you forgotten what we came here for? Are you willing to give up on seeing your mother ever again for this? I'm sorry, Layla, but I really have to go. My mom's in danger. Then please take me with you. I can't stay in this hideous house anymore. Come on, you have everything on earth here. It's like heaven. No, it's hell. All this stuff is just meaningless. What I need is freedom, school, friends, and being able to do what I want. Turns out, after her parents' divorce, her dad did everything to win custody and kept her here just to make money from her gorgeous blonde hair. I miss mom. I'd rather live in a small, shabby house than this flashy, cold place. I couldn't leave her here. Suddenly, I remembered how Eugene saves Rapunzel in the movie. So after getting Layla's approval, I cut her hair short, and the three of us ran away from this penthouse. We dropped Layla off at school, where her mom was already waiting for her. The simplest things like freedom, friends, or someone who truly cares for us are much more valuable than superficial material things. Sadly, I always craved what I didn't have and took what I did have for granted. Let's go. Why are you still standing here? Huh? We have to attend the class too? Ain't no time for this. We gotta find Red Riding Hood. Without a word, Arthur just dragged me away, eventually stopping in front of a girl wearing a scarf on her head. Here she is, the person you need. I waved at her, but she just coldly looked up and asked, What do you want? Huh? Red Riding Hood was none other than Katie? Um, I'll get right to the point. I really need your red scarf. Can you excuse me? This is Gucci. Do you know how much it costs? It's from even the limited edition. Look at you. You probably don't even have a dime to your name. Yeah, it is true, but... I really need this scarf. I'll do anything you want. All right. Hope you don't regret saying that. Right after that, a luxury car came to pick us up. We stopped at an apple farm, which was familiar to me as it was where my mom worked. Well, I want to bake an apple pie for my mom, so pick me a box of apples. Remember, you have to do it alone. Your friend's out. <laughs> my mom can even pick an average of 12 boxes a day, so one box was just a piece of cake. But who knows her one box was actually a container of 1,000 pounds of apples. Did she want to bake for the whole town? Oh, I'm exhausted. Who on earth could pick apples under this scorching heat for hours? My head started spinning. Losing balance, I fell off the ladder. Luckily, Arthur caught me just in time. Still, your mom does this every day. Can you imagine how hard she works to earn food for the family? Maybe that's why my mom is always tired and cranky. Suddenly, I missed her so much. I finally harvested enough apples and brought them into exchange for the scarf. But Katie still made me choose the 10 most perfect apples out of them. No matter which ones I chose, she gave a dissatisfied scowl. This apple is not okay. Neither is this one. It has a 2 centimeter scratch. You're too much. It's all the same. No way. Everything for my mom must be the best. She's sick, and I need a perfect pie for her. Then Katie told me that when her mom was pregnant, she found out she was sick. The doctor advised her to terminate the pregnancy for her safety, but she refused and risked her life to give birth to Katie. Hearing that story, my eyes just naturally welled up with tears. What now? Are you tired from this little bit of work? No, I just miss my mom so much. I really want to get back to her. I realize that even Katie, the heartless, mean girl, still loves her mom this much. Yet, all I do is ask and plead with my mom. I'm such a terrible child. If you love your mom that much, you know what to do from now on. Help me deliver this gift to your heroic mother, will you? And here, 
take it and complete the mission. Finally, we've arrived. Our final destination is a museum. Arthur said that there will be a secret room with the magic lamp, but getting the key to that room was already a hassle. There were security lasers all over the place, so we broke in through the ventilation system. Arthur tied a rope around my waist and then slowly dropped me down where the key was. Just a little more and I got it! But as soon as I touched the key, a drop of my sweat fell, causing the alarm to go off. The guards rushed in from the door, but fortunately, Arthur pulled me up in time. We got out of the ventilation system, but this place was like a maze. Then Arthur pulled me to hide behind a wall. Little by little, his face was getting closer and closer to mine, and my heart was pounding like crazy. Suddenly, the whole wall behind me moved. Turns out there was a secret staircase leading down to the basement, and it took us no time to find the room. Huh? Where's the magic lamp? Arthur approached the only object in the room. It's a projector. He turned it on, then on the white wall appeared the image of my mum, being tired after a long day of work. But when she got home, she still came to check if I was sleeping well. The image of her waking up early to make me my favorite breakfast. Above all, she totally knows about the camping trip and is trying to work overtime so I could join it. Time is running out. You should hurry to go back and hand in these items. I tried to regain my composure, quickly wiped away the tears, and left with Arthur. I'll be back with my mom soon. I'm back! Please take me to the gate! Suddenly, a chiming sound got me frozen. I'm sorry, but time's up! You failed the quest. But why worry? It isn't so bad here. You'll have everything you could ever want. At any cost, please lead me to that monster! I don't need anything else. I just want to be with my mom. I've been thoughtless all this time. I can't leave her when she needs me most. Actually, there is no monster here. It is the greed, selfishness, and ingratitude inside of every one of us. But I can see. You already defeated your monster and learned the lesson. So, you can go back to your mom now. Huh? Everything was so bright. Where was I? Honey, you're awake, thank goodness. Someone squeezed my hand. It was Mom. Mom told me how she'd collapsed at work due to overworking. Then she found out I'd fallen off my bike in the snowstorm and knocked myself unconscious. Here you go, sweetie. My mom placed some money in my hand. Now you can go on the camping trip. I'm so sorry for upsetting you. And I promise I will work extra hard so you don't have to go without. I burst into tears and shook my head. I don't need it. I don't want you working overtime and putting your health at risk for me. Having you healthy and by my side is all I need. Mom, please forgive me for everything. As we pulled apart, I noticed someone standing in the doorway. Arthur. Turns out, it was Arthur who rescued me in the snowstorm. Thank you so much. You're my knight in shining armor. Anytime. I'm just glad you're okay. I mean it. I wouldn't have completed the tasks without you. Huh? What tasks? Looking into his dreamy eyes, I honestly felt like he'd been sent by my dad to help me learn from my mistakes and be grateful for what I had. <laughs> Never mind. I'm just glad you're here. How's it possible that I've never set foot in a place this close to me before? It's kind of dark and eerie. If only it was covered in flowers, then it'd totally be a Disney castle. Oh, someone's here. I went to say hi, but she didn't seem very welcoming. Stay away from this spooky place before it sucks the life out of you, young girl. So that means you're not working here anymore? The maid just shook her head before she hurried off. Here comes my chance. Hey guys, Joe Casta here. And this Dracula-esque castle is none other than Mr. Joseph Williams. Are you wondering who that is? Hmm, I'm curious too. All I know about him is that he's my parents' creditor, and I'm here to ask him to extend the deadline for their debt. But as one of his mates just quit, I could work here to pay off the debt instead, right? Hello, I'm Jocasta, your new maid. No answer. Should I just come in? If anything, the master should blame the old maid for leaving the gates open. So I had to find my own way inside. Hello? I'm the new maid. Master, are you here? No? Not here. Not here either. Is he still sleeping at this hour? Oh, there he is. Huh? He's not old and gray like I thought he'd be. I introduced myself, then he returned to his painting and coldly said, Work off your debt? 
Fine. Let's see how long you'll last. Just keep in mind, don't ever make me angry. Oh, Master, you're worrying over nothing. I wouldn't even care about you. But turns out he wasn't worrying over nothing. He's actually infuriatingly difficult. The curtains must remain drawn during nighttime. There must be absolutely no noise at all, and his bedroom is strictly forbidden. Who gave you permission to sit there? Oops, I forgot. I must keep a distance of ten feet from him at all times, even during meals. Phew, finally it's time to rest. Though I've been working here for a couple of days, I'm still not used to Master Joseph's ridiculous rules. Huh? What's that staring at me? Ah! Rats! There's a rat! Help! What on earth are you shrieking about at this hour? You dare to disturb my sleep? Master, save me! There it is! It's coming! He stood bravely like a warrior, ready to fight the beast. Look at his broad shoulders, his hair, his chiseled face, and... His every movement is so smooth. That hideous rat was finally running scared. What a relief! You're making a fuss over nothing. Move to another room tomorrow. This one is too shabby. Looking closely, my fastidious master looks kind of handsome, doesn't he? Well, living here isn't so bad now that I've got the hang of his rules. <laughs> Bring me a cup of tea. Yes, master. Here you go. Pass it to me. Huh? Are we off social distancing now? I excitedly handed him the cup of tea, but he missed it and tea spilled all over him. Clumsy dummy! Can't you look at what you're doing? I hurriedly wiped the stain on his clothes and apologized profusely, but he roared again. Stop! How dare you come this close to me! Get out! Jeez, his temperament changed like the seasons. Hot, cold, hot, cold. Whatever. I'll just go home then. Indeed, no place like home. Oh, how comfy. I told Judy, my bestie, about my week working in the castle. Interested? Wanna come with me someday? No, no, no chance. Haven't you seen anything unusual there? Then Judy said rumor had it that a mad scientist once lived there. And werewolves too. As horrible howls could be heard during a full moon. You have to be careful. There's a reason why no one goes there. Oh no, it's today. Wolves howling under the moon? Never mind, Judy is just being childish. Who still believes in such fiction? Definitely not me. So, ta-da! I'm back again. Honestly, I need this job. I can't let him fire me, even if I have to cling to his leg and beg, but... Where is he? Should I... I opened the door to see him lying there, surrounded by dull paintings, while tools scattered everywhere. What happened? I tried lifting him, nudged him. Still, he wouldn't come around. Then suddenly, his eyes opened. Hey, the ten-foot rule doesn't apply because that was an emergency. Have you eaten anything since yesterday? As I thought, if you still want to kick me out now, you'll have nothing to eat. After that incident, Joseph seemed more at ease. He stopped threatening me with his rules and just let me ramble on. One time, when I was napping on the couch after cleaning, he even put a blanket on me. <laughs> I haven't slept yet, dear master. Then one day, a middle-aged woman appeared at the gate. She introduced herself as Joseph's mom and gifted him a beautiful bird. But she didn't come inside and just sarcastically said, Oh, my son's got a new maid again. This weird boy. So sorry for you, poor girl. I brought the bird to Joseph, excitedly told him that his mom just dropped by. Look what lovely present she got you. Lovely? That woman's just mocking me. I'm stuck in this place like a bird in a cage. I think it's a thoughtful gift. You seem to like painting birds. Stop prying. This is none of your business. Okay, I'm sorry. But it's your own choice to isolate yourself from the outside world. Come with me. I have something special to show you. Oh, this place is still as gorgeous as the first time I came here. Looks like Joseph is mesmerized too. See? The world is beautiful. You just need to look. We were walking along the blooming flower path. Then suddenly... He's coming! The wolf! Wolf! Then all the gardeners immediately scrammed in panic. What have I done to you, you morons? Beautiful, you say? Then Joseph stormed off. I tried to catch him, but... Ouch! I tripped over a rock. Oh, it hurts! It freaking hurts! Then let me apply the antiseptic cream. No, that will only make it worse. Maybe doing something fun could ease the pain. I'll be distracted from this. Please, can we watch a movie? And of course, he couldn't refuse. Oops. Awkward. Clearly, I didn't think it through when picking this rom-com. Wonder what my master is thinking. Oh gosh, there's no need to be that emotional. His scary appearance startled me. 
Eyes turned white, mouth snarled, as if he wanted to eat me alive. I tried to stay calm to ask him what was going on, but Joseph was like a madman, frantically smashing things and howling. Stop, Joseph! Please don't do it! Ah, my arm! Realizing that he'd just hurt me, Joseph seemed to regain his senses. He then ran off in a panic. I quickly hugged him. It's okay. It's okay. Calm down. Once he'd felt better, he started telling me his biggest secret. Since childhood, he'd had difficulty controlling his emotions, which often led to outbursts of anger. Later on, the moon also triggered this reaction after his stepfather passed away on a full moon night, and it then became traumatizing because Joseph feared he'd been the cause of his death. That was also the cause of the tension between him and his mother. I think I was born with this strange condition. As a child, my stepfather used to give me some medicine to keep it under control. His stepfather used to give him pills? Judy also mentioned the mad scientist who used to live here. Is that... Hmm, I have to figure it out. One night, I sneaked into the room that Joseph forbade me to enter. On rummaging around, I found a tape that showed me the whole terrifying plan of his stepfather to regularly give Joseph a power-boosting pill as an experiment, and also to take him to the mountains to test out some new crazy invention. What on earth was that? But I can't tell Joseph right away. He needs to be mentally stable first. So I started off by taking him out for a walk, and when he felt comfortable enough, I suggested we go downtown together for some grocery shopping. He was just like a hedgehog, prickling up every time someone accidentally touched him. But, of course, I know how to tame this hot headmaster. Just like this. There you go. Then we started tidying and redecorating the whole castle to liven up the mood of this place. When we got to the last room, his stepfather's, he seemed a bit hesitant. It's been so long. This room also needs cleaning, else the furniture may become damaged. Do you know anything about your stepfather's videos? Uh, how do you know? Then Joseph searched for a memory card, then gave it to me. I was so scared that I hid it and never dared look at it. I wanted to destroy it once, but on second thought, it contains the last images of my stepdad, so I've always kept it here. Huh? This wasn't what I meant. So there's another video apart from the ones I saw. This may shed light on everything. If you don't mind, can I watch that video? I'm quite curious. From that day, we never spoke of the videos again. Instead, we went for walks, cooked, and meditated together. And today's schedule is this art exhibition. Look at his surprised face. <laughs> they look familiar, right? Don't tell me you don't recognize your own artwork. It seems that each painting tells a story. I can't wait to know who the artist is. They must be an experienced and profound person. I knew it. These compliments will help him erase his own self-doubts. Back from the exhibition, we noticed a delicious smell coming from the dining room. Who could that be? It was Joseph's mother. Joseph seemed surprised by his mom's presence, but I wasn't because I was the director behind the scene. In fact, I secretly asked her to organize that exhibition. Watching the video cleared everything up. On that moonlit night, the mad scientist took Joseph to the mountains to test the effects of a super power boosting concoction. But when he saw Joseph reacting abnormally, he panicked and ran away. So the accident happened. It wasn't Joseph's fault. He was, in fact, a victim. I told Joseph's mom the truth beforehand, which led to this touching reconciliation. Now that things were clear as day, they have untied the knot in their hearts. His mother decided to move here to help him overcome his trauma of the moon with me. Oh, he also told me about the time he dropped a teacup on purpose as an excuse to push me away so that I'd be safe. How sweet and caring he is. Oh shoot, who left this curtain open? I hurried over to close it when suddenly a hand gently touched mine. Before you came, I really never thought I'd ever have the courage to face moonlight. But Jocasta... With you by my side now, anything feels possible. Blue sky, white clouds, golden sand. Such a perfect day for sunbathing on this luxury Hawaiian beach. While being served by Kirby, my arch enemy. That brat used to tease me all the time about my old clothes and messy hair. Little did she know, I was secretly a millionaire. Earth to chlorine. Castle building all day won't fill your stomach. Finish your shift and go home. Well, Mary, who doesn't want to get rich? Sadly, some of us can only dream about it. If you want to be Cinderella, then go find yourself a prince. Just not Danny. He's just as poor as us. Do not underestimate my Danny. My precious heart fell for him for a reason. 
It's just that he doesn't seem to realize that we're destined for each other yet. But Mary was right. My dinner won't cook itself. Let's see what we can afford for tonight. My dad left us when I was four, and since then, mom worked her socks off to provide for us. So it was down to me to also work to save up for my law school dream. All of a sudden, groceries started raining down on me. Bottles tumbled off the shelves and broke into pieces right by my feet. Ah, is it an earthquake? I stooped down and prayed until it stopped. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but geez, it sure left a freaking mess. Warren, the store owner, looked distraught. This place was all he had, so I helped him clean up and place anything undamaged back on the shelves. Before you leave, please take this as a token of my gratitude. I hope it brings you luck. A lottery ticket? I don't know how this game works. I'll show you. It's simple. Each ticket has a unique set of numbers. Just check the results on TV tonight and see if they match. Let me see. Your numbers are 15, 26, 14, 48, 0, 7, 23. Hey, those are the lucky numbers that have been on my mind all day. I want that ticket. Kirby, stop poking your nose in my business, will you? Sorry, miss, that's the last ticket today, and I already gave it to Clarine. Then I'll buy it. Here's your two bucks. Give it to me. You wish. I didn't really care about this ticket, but there's no way I was going to let her get what she wanted. And surely, she wouldn't leave me alone. How about ten bucks? That's a fortune to the likes of you. No thanks. I'd rather win millions instead and make you my maid. Look, you'll never get anything from me, be it this ticket or Danny. Just give up. Fine! Let me skip this stupid ticket, but Danny, never! Why are we always bickering, you ask? Well, we're both competing for the heart of Danny. Tennis extraordinaire and brooding Adonis. Actually, I thought I had more advantage as he worked part-time at the same restaurant. But nope, Danny was such a cold fish. I tried again and again, but every single time, he just gave me a soulless thank you and that's it. If only I could build him his own tennis courts, perhaps he'd change his attitude. But that's impossible for a poor girl like me, unless I somehow hit the jackpot. The lucky numbers today are 48, 07, 15. Should I add winning the lottery to my daydream list? <laughs> 26, 14. Is it just me or do those numbers sound familiar? No way, it can't be. And the mega ball is... 23! Now if your ticket has all six numbers, you win over 20 million dollars! Play on! Me! I think I just become a millionaire! God had answered my prayers. What? Kirby's here too? The ticket must have hit it for real. I rush there to rummage through the trash. And, ah, here it is! It's mine! As if. Let's go ask Warren who this ticket belongs to then. Brilliant. And then give him a third of the prize? Do you really expect him not to ask for a share? Right. Okay, let it go and I'll give you a 30% share. Great ratio, but 30% is a perfect fit for you. I'll take 70% and Danny. Oh, that's how you want to play. Fine then. How about whoever wins Danny's heart gets 70%? Deal. So we agreed to hide the lottery ticket in a trunk with two locks. Each of us kept one key to it. Then we buried it in a bush at school. Looks like the secret race between us starts now. Kirby wasted no time and brought Danny the showiest lunches ever. But he kept up his cold exterior and barely acknowledged her. Seems like I need a more delicate approach. So I told Mary to arrange a team building game among the restaurant staff, in which we all had to answer the same questions to understand one another better. Oh look! He liked watching Star Trek, listening to Sam Smith, and reading Harry Potter like me. Oh, Danny boy, I told you we were destined to be a pair. Next question. What is the key to maintaining a long-term relationship? There's our very first answer. Feelings? Come on, Danny, be realistic. What uses do feelings have if you can even afford to go on a date? Poor people can also be happy in love, but I don't think pragmatic people like you can. No, no, he misunderstood what I meant. After that, he ignored me completely. Worse still, Kooky Kirby never left him alone. She even brought the whole cheerleading team to do this ridiculous routine while he was playing. Who cheers on a tennis court? She was going big, so I needed to step up my game. It's time to bust out my college savings. I spent the whole day at the mall buying him gifts and giving myself a makeover. This is the first time in my life I've spent my hard-earned money without considering the price. It feels so good, but at the same time, kind of bad. 
But I could make it up with a lottery money once I got Danny's heart. Look, I saw this watch and I immediately thought of you. I even met a professional tennis player at the mall. Can you believe it? And they told me this racket is the best. What do you think? You're crazy. This costs thousands. Why are you doing this? Um, that's not the reaction I was expecting. But I like you, Danny. I've not been brave enough to tell you this because I had nothing. But soon, my life would change and I can give you everything. I don't need those things. You're so wasteful and superficial. You really think money can buy anything, including feelings? Why was he so mad at me? I thought he must have noticed that I'd worked really hard for all this and even made myself look prettier for him. Okay, he might not like my gifts, but is it so bad that I want to be a little generous to myself now that I have some money? Things got even worse when later I arrived at work to see Kirby booking out the entire restaurant to let her Danny take a rest and enjoy dinner with her. Fine, you win Kirby, I give up. <sighs> Nothing, basically nothing went the way I wanted. My luck, my money, my man. Now I'm fine with just the 30% God gave me. I'm done chasing anyone. Only my stray friends understand me. Muffin, Brownie, Oreo. Wait, where's Cupcake? Looking for him? Let him go. This wasteful, superficial girl needs to make sure he's not starving. So you're the one who feeds them every day? Why do you care? Go back to your date with Kirby. I'm just a materialist who thinks money solves everything. I'm sorry for how I acted earlier. It's just that, at home, I'm surrounded by people who are all about money. So I hate that way of life. Why are you talking like you come from money or something? Yeah, kinda. My parents are the presidents of Sunland Corp. What? The biggest furniture corporation in the city? Unbelievable! So why are you working part-time at a restaurant? I want to earn my own money. An independent life suits me much better. You're so silly. Why struggle if you don't have to? If I were you, my life would be so different. I'd make sure that my mom didn't need to work all the time to make ends meet. I could even go to any expensive law school I want and care for all the stray cats and dogs I find. Surprisingly, this time, Danny didn't look at me with jaded eyes like before. Instead, he just listened patiently and gave me the sweetest smile ever. But not love. That's one thing money can't buy. H how about Kirby? Did any of her grand gestures impress you? <laughs> I prefer the cats. Our talk has confirmed that there's still a chance for me. Kirby's only advantage over me is money, but Danny doesn't care about that anyway. Is that the new student? Seems like Danny just found a worthy opponent. He's Finn. Look how he smiles whenever his opponent catches up a point. Wait, did you just call Danny someone's opponent? Someone has a new crush. Who? who? Don't talk nonsense. Right then, a ball zoomed toward us. And holy moly, Finn caught it just mere inches from Kirby's face. Are you okay? She's fine. Her face always turns red. Nothing to do with a ball. Kirby was so embarrassed that she ran off. <laughs> it seems our race took a turn. But then, shockingly, Finn turned to me and asked for my number? Huh? Does my charm glow this much? Everyone knew I liked Danny, but he's such a riddle. Hmm. Maybe I could use Finn as my last card to make Danny jealous and bait Kirby to give up on our deal. What a genius I am! Then, for the next few days, whenever Danny was around, I flirted with Finn and made sure Kirby saw us. One day, I made an excuse to borrow Finn's phone. Then I secretly used it to send Danny a message to stir up his jealousy. If you don't like Clarine, then let me play with this innocent girl for a bit. And Kirby also needs a kick to admit her feelings as well, right? Actually, I like you. Looking into your eyes, I know you also have feelings for me, so... And finally, I set a date for them at the tennis court tonight at 8. If Danny doesn't want me to get hurt and Kirby doesn't want to miss her true love, they'll show up. Then I covered up my tracks, blocked both our numbers, and returned his phone. Thank you so much. Are you free tonight? Come to the tennis court. I have something important to tell you. Oh god, Finn looks like he just won the Wimbledon. That night, Finn got there early and was really excited. Let's see who'll raise the curtain. Ah, it's Kirby. Oh, Finn, you had me at hello. But admitting my feelings means I lose the deal with Clarine, so... What do you mean? What deal? No, no, don't get me wrong. Actually, we won the lottery and made a deal to share it. Anyways, silly me. Money can compare to you. Lottery? You two share it? Why did she even mention the money? Right when it's getting messy, Danny turned up. Bastard, now you're two-timing? Danny, why are you here? He's just playing with you. This jerk is seeing both you and Kirby. Don't let him fool you. 
I think Finn is a nice guy. Plus, I've told you how I felt, but you've never seemed to like me back. So Finn, we... Finn told me he liked me. Clarine, I like you. More than you know. Can't you see? I've given a lot of... Hints. I always make excuses to go home with you. I told you that feelings were the most important thing to me. As in my feelings for you. Really? Idiot. How am I supposed to pick up those hints? So this daydreamer wasn't just imagining things? Turns out my plan actually did succeed. Kirby, it's true. I do like you. But I thought you were out of my league, so I just wanted to ask Clarine for help. Oh, how nice. Kirby, with a huge grin, then admitted I won. Then she dragged Finn away. Hmm, I guess my biggest win is successfully pairing up two couples. The next morning, Kirby and I opened the trunk to get the ticket. When to our utter shock, Finn swooped in and snatched it away. While we were still processing what was going on, he ran off with our millions. But then, a shadow sent him tumbling to the ground. Danny? I saw him following you two and knew he was up to something shady. Then, Finn confessed that he transferred schools and approached me for the lottery ticket following his dad's order, who's none other than... Warren! He knew it was a jackpot-winning ticket, so he set up a plan to steal it from me! I'm so sorry. My dad's a gambling addict, which left him heavily in debt, and only this ticket could save him. Oh, Finn. I believe he's not a bad person. This ticket was originally from Warren anyway, so we both agreed to give him a share to pay off his debt. Finn was moved and handed the ticket back to us. On learning this, Warren thanked us and offered to drive us to Tallahassee to claim our prize. He even carefully got me to double-check that my ticket was in my purse. But halfway there, the car suddenly broke down, so the four of us got out and gave it a push. But as we started pushing, Warren suddenly sped away, leaving all of us standing there in shock. Where's your purse, Clarine? I left it in the car. That greedy snake Warren did this on purpose to run away with a ticket. Now what to do? Walk back home or walk to Tallahassee? Calm down. Danny already has a backup plan. This is the real ticket. Enjoy the view for now. A taxi is coming to pick us up. Actually, the moment Warren offered to drive us all the way to Tallahassee, I sent something sketchy. So I swapped the tickets. <sighs> My dad's gone too far this time. He needs to stop gambling and work hard to pay off his debts instead. Finally, we got the cash prize. However, the four of us decided not to divide it anymore. Instead, we're building a shelter for stray animals together. Surprisingly, our project soon reached many philanthropists and now our fund has been expanded across the US. Since then, Kirby is no longer obnoxious. Now she even wants to become a veterinarian. And me? I will continue to work my way into the law school of my dreams. My hard work has really paid off because they just sent me an acceptance letter. I might not be rich, but in all honesty, it doesn't matter, as I couldn't be happier. How long is this gonna take? So much for taking care of me. Lex, starting today, I'm locking your phone and laptop away. Cruel! Isn't one leg cast enough punishment? Excuse me, you don't deserve to have a say in this. If you hadn't bought our daughter that death trap motorbike in the first place, she'd still be intact. Yeah, sorry for making sure she doesn't grow up boring like her mom. Yeah, another lecture on how irresponsible I was eventually turned into a quarrel between mom and dad instead. They stopped only when mom needed to leave for her business trip in Egypt. I'm done arguing with you. I have a flight to catch. I've got my eye on you, young lady. All the way from Egypt? That's kinda hard. Well, at least Dad's here, so I won't be by myself. The next morning, I woke up to see a note stuck to the fridge. Alex, I'm shooting my new movie in Spain for a few months. There is a strict no phone policy to avoid leaks. So, if it isn't urgent, don't call me. Love, Dad. Seriously? Choosing work over me? Why am I still surprised? That's when you get when you have a world-famous actor dad and an award-winning photographer mom. They're rarely home, and whenever they are, they're constantly at each other's throats. All the more reason for me to hang out with my biker gang. I love motorcycles. They're my only getaway. But that's how I messed up my leg. In my defense, I could totally nail that trick and win their stupid bet if it wasn't for that bumpy road. However, not a single one of my homies has checked on me since then. Not even my boyfriend, Blake. But what's really bumming me out is that school's out for summer, yet I can hardly move. So, bored out of my mind, I came up with a new way to entertain myself. 
which was playing candid camera on this whole suburbia. Thanks to my mom's camera, I had eyes on the newlyweds Cunninghams on the right, the carpenters on the left, a few other houses, and ooh, tiny Timmy across the street. I swear to god, I almost thought some hunky guy had just moved in. My childhood friend Tiny Timmy had officially grown into Timothy. He looked just like a muscular version of Timothy Chalamet. Then Tim suddenly sat up and we accidentally made eye contact. Awkward. Looking good, handsome. He's even cuter when he smiles. Oh, he's replying. Even better up close. That's bold, Timmy. Too bad though. Sorry, lame. Tim looks confused at first. Then when he saw my cast, he immediately leaves the room. Huh? A broken leg is enough to scare him off? He's lame. Then the doorbell rang. Hey, that took a while. You're here? Of course, you need to have a closer look, and could use a hand, or a leg. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> come help this damsel in distress. From then on, Tim came over every day to help me out around the house. He'd been really helpful and even tried riding my motorcycle so it didn't have to sit idle for too long. Other than that bulked up body, he's still the friend I knew back in the day. We still had so much fun playing video games and watching movies together. You have to watch Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. It's nuts. Actually, I thought you might be into Ladybird. Such a heartwarming coming-of-age story. Ew, no way. Timothy Chalamet is in it. Okay, sold. But how do you know that it'd sway me? I just do. Like how I know you spy on me from time to time, which, by the way, is super creepy. Yeah, right. As if he didn't intentionally leave his blinds open while working out, Mr. Shy Guy. One day, as usual, me and Tim were hanging out when suddenly my dear boyfriend Blake made a noisy entrance. Babe, you won't believe this. There's a raising tournament going on in the Upper West Side. You have to come. What's going on here? Sup. What do you mean, sup? Who's this little brat? Oh, this is Tim. Tim, this is Blake. Say hi. Hi. I don't care. What do you think you're doing? Watch your tongue. You've been ignoring me for weeks, and now you show up raving on about some dumb street racing contest? You don't even remember that I broke my leg, do you? But, but, you're mine! Blake was fuming like a bull ready for battle and about to throw hands at Tim, but he stopped his fist midair. A defeated-looking Blake fled off as soon as he got out of Tim's grip. Coward. I apologized to Tim for dragging him into this mess, and he was surprisingly cool about it. Just curious, how did Blake and you become a thing? He's the leader of the biker gang, so I thought he was cool, but honestly, I never expected our relationship to last, just like every other couple's. Exhibit A, my parents. I see. My dad's a good example as well. Then Tim revealed that his dad left his mom for another woman last year, which really upset him. I could relate so much to his situation. Maybe being locked up at home wasn't so bad after all, since we had the chance to catch up on everything. But the following morning, when I was chilling in my room, something horrible caught my eye. Something blonde. It looked like she was returning a hoodie to Tim. What kind of friend borrows a hoodie and acts like that around each other? Let's see what he has to say for himself. Who's that blonde? What was she doing at your place today? What? Who? She might look like strawberry shortcake, but don't be fooled. Whatever love you two might think you have will soon fade. That sweetness will turn sour in no time. Tim just burst out laughing. What's so funny? What made you think so? You don't even know Annabelle. <laughs> don't believe me? See for yourself. I then showed him all of the secrets I'd uncovered in our seemingly quiet neighborhood. First off, the couple from number 9 were both having affairs. The daughter from number 11 was using her boyfriend to hide her real relationship with another girl. And last but not least, the Carpenters, who seemed like suburban couples goal, actually had a far from blissful life due to Mr. Carpenter's drinking problem. In conclusion, there's no such thing as real love. I see your point, but on the other side of the spectrum, genuine love does exist. Tim points the camera towards the Cunninghams. Hmm, I'm not buying their poster couple act. Then, one day, Tim said he had to work overtime at the library to prepare for an event with, you guessed it, Annabelle only. I had to hide my anger as I watched Tim drive off with Blondie. With nothing else to do, I decided to watch the Cunninghams. Geez, how could they seem so lovey-dovey all the time?
I wanted to take my mind off of Tim, but the more I observed them, the more I thought about him with that Barbie. That's when I saw a book that Tim borrowed for me from the library. Looks like it's time to return it. I Ubered there, but there are many people here as well. Why did Tim say that the two of them would be here alone? Tim's face turned into the scream when he saw me. Didn't think I could get this far? Hi, don't mind me. I'm just here to return this. You should have just given it to me. Oh god, no. I can see that you're busy with... Annabelle, isn't it? Yeah. How do you know my name? Oh, let's see. You remind me of that creepy doll who's also an absolute nightmare. Tim then immediately dragged me away. See? He's caring for me, not you, Annie. However, the fun was interrupted right away when I saw Blake outside. Time for you to pay. Tim immediately stood between Blake and me, but to our surprise, Blake signaled for his goons hiding close by to show themselves. Clearly outnumbered, I tried to stop the situation from getting worse. Let's be civilized here. We can sort this out without violence. You're right, babe. We can settle this with a bet. Whoever can do the trick that broke Lex's leg and top it off with the Akira slide can have her fair and square. The loser has to back down. First of all, I'm not some kind of trophy. Second of all, that stunt is incredibly dangerous. Right, Tim? Sounds worth it, though. Have both of you lost your minds? Tim went first, and even though he flunked it, he managed to land without a scratch, while Blake landed on his face. Of course, that fiasco got the whole gang so embarrassed, they scrammed immediately. But I was still so annoyed. Congratulations, you won absolutely nothing. Not that I didn't care about him, I just couldn't stand his recklessness anymore. The next day, I was woken up by a doorbell. So, what are you here for? Sorry about last night, but if you stayed longer, I could have told you that I did what I did because I like you. Romantic styles. I don't even remember since when, but I do remember how sad I was when we stopped hanging out. Believe it or not, I started working out just to impress you. Whoa, what? Tim explained that nothing was going on between Annabelle and him. They were simply co-workers. And he made up that whole thing about being alone with her at the library to see my reaction. What do you say? I can make you believe in love. Tim, don't be ridiculous. Love isn't anything like the movies. It's merely a temporary chemical reaction in your brain that makes you think you're really feeling it. Come on, just give it a chance. No, look at my parents, your father, all the families in this neighborhood. If you ask me, your feelings for me right now will fade, just like mine with Blake. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I thought I was special enough for you to take a leap of faith. Now I know how wrong I was. He then left without another word. When Tim closed his blinds, honestly, I felt a sting in my chest. This is for the best, right? I can't deny the uneasiness I felt without Tim. It's not that he didn't want us to make up. I just didn't know how. Seeing how happy and smiley he was with her, my uneasy feeling only grew bigger. Is this what they call love? No, no, no. It's not real. Happy-looking families are not actually happy, and the Cunninghams are just good at faking it. What's that I'm hearing? Are they fighting? I saw the husband suddenly punch the wall with rage, then push the wife. I no longer had eyes on them, but could hear a huge commotion over there. What on earth is going on? Panicked, I called the cops right away. Wait a second, that means their happy marriage really was fake. I excitedly limped across the street to tell Tim about my discovery, then dragged him over to the Cunningham's front lawn. However, when the cops arrived, both of them answered the door perfectly fine. Turns out they already knew about my spying, and were so annoyed by it, they decided to pull a prank on me. Great, my curious neighbors have also witnessed this whole humiliating ordeal. But the worst part was seeing the disappointment on Tim's face. You have to stop being so stubborn. Not every family is like yours. I couldn't say a word, not even when the cops gave me a warning. That night, I tossed and turned as Tim's words wiggled around my mind. Suddenly, something caught my attention. It's from Tim's house. Some flashlights were moving around. I tried calling Tim, but he didn't answer. Of course, he'd be in deep sleep by now. Calling the cops was useless because of that very recent embarrassing incident. That's it. I'm doing it myself. Out there on Tim's front lawn, my heart was beating like crazy. 
Thieves! Thieves! The startled thieves turned around, so I blared the air horn, then shouted. Freeze! Stay where you are! Hands over your heads! But... Obviously, I, a teenager with one working leg, never actually expected any criminal to stand still. They quickly got a hold of me, and right when I thought my life was over. Get away from her! Tim, thank goodness! Other neighbors also came and stopped the thieves. Tim called the cops, and this time, they reported to the scene ASAP. Phew, that was insane. Mrs. Jones, Tim's mom, thanked me and invited me to stay the night. It's really nice of her even though she burst out laughing when I explained the situation with the Cunninghams. When Tim went to grab some drinks for us, she asked me why I was alone in this condition. So, I spilled everything about my family. Contrary to her reaction just now, she showed me sympathy. From her experience, love didn't always have a happy ending, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Tim's dad and I had genuine feelings for each other. It's just that over time, things changed. We're open to accept this and be honest with each other. That's what real love is. I wouldn't change a thing and I would still fall crazily in love with him, despite knowing we would eventually break up. Because that's how I got Tim, the second real love of my life. Her words hit different. Maybe I'd given love a bad name. You're right, love is not at fault. And Tim is so lucky to have a loving mom like you. Meanwhile, my parents don't just hate each other, they put it all on me too. Bet you, even tonight's incident won't make them care. I see where you're coming from, but why don't you just give it a try? Their reactions might surprise you. So, I called them up, and guess what? They both sounded concerned on the phone and said they'd come home as soon as they could. See, I told you so. It's alright now. Timmy, please show Lex where she'll be sleeping. That was really brave of you. Being all heroic out there despite your whole situation. I wouldn't have risked my life if it wasn't for- If it wasn't for what? I'm all ears. For you. I'm sorry I overreacted. The thought of becoming a boring old couple who hate each other bugged me. But then I realized if we were together, we wouldn't have to be that. We could be like the Cunninghams. That doesn't sound too bad now, does it? I guess not. Next morning, I woke up to my parents' call. They actually kept their promise this time. My mom explained that she thought dad was home to take care of me. While dad absentmindedly assumed mom only left in a fit of anger and was going to return soon. So they really do care about me. They just have a terrible way of showing it. They stayed together thinking it would be best for me. But the unending tension and bickering was eating us all up from the inside. This incident opened their eyes. So they agreed to have a peaceful divorce while still looking after me together. I'm finally free from the cast. But I actually feel even more liberated than before. Is this the power of my newfound belief in love? Is it because I've realized that love was around me all along? I'm not sure myself, but who cares? Alex and Timothy signing off. Hi, I'm Donna, an influencer extraordinaire and soon-to-be supermodel. My family are my biggest supporters. Look, there's my sister Charlotte. Even though my parents are busy running the family corporation, they buy me whatever I want. This includes this spectacular dress for the upcoming Elite Model Look Contest. Girls, get ready! We're eating out tonight! Yay! Charlotte just helped Dad secure another business contract, so it's time to celebrate! At the restaurant, Mom, Dad, and Charlotte walked ahead while I showed my 329,587 followers around. My fans even commented that I should compete for Miss USA. Suddenly, someone bumped into me, causing me to drop my phone. Oh no! My live stream's ended, and it's all his fault! Idiot, you ruined my live stream! Now my fans will think I'm rude and unfollow me. Are you walking with your eyes closed? Sorry, I didn't mean to. Let me make it up for you. Donna the Fabulous? Okay, you've just got one more follower. What a jinx! He better stay out of my sight. But as soon as I reached our table, I saw his face again. Why is he here? Donna, this is Matthew, our new finance director. Oh, how important. But not as much as live streaming, right? Who does he think he is? Charlotte even laughed at his stupid joke. Speaking of which, Donna, you're going to study business from now on. Time to stop those modeling live streaming things. What? But why? You've always supported my dreams before. But Dad just ignored me and chatted with Matthew. Dad was being so unreasonable. Everything was fine until that Matthew guy showed up. 
Charlotte comforted me and suggested we attend business classes for me while I prepared for the modeling contest. What a brilliant idea! Oh, I love my amazing, quick-witted sister! I then put all of my focus into practicing for the contest. But Matthew kept on disturbing me with his nonsense. He even sent me a picture of wedding rings saying, Are these okay? Think they'll match us? I frantically called him to ask him what all the gibberish was about. Hasn't your dad told you yet? We're getting engaged and taking charge of the company together. What on earth is this guy saying? Since when was I expected to marry some guy I barely knew and take over a business I had no interest in? Dad should have some explanation for this. Upon arriving home, I confronted Dad, but he just sighed and said he was planning on telling me himself. But you can't just dictate my career and who I marry. Donna, I only want the best for you. But Dad, Donna didn't even attend her business classes and is still indulging in her nonsense fashion club. How can you expect her to handle the company? Oh no, why is she telling him that? Was she trying to help me? She's right, Dad. I have no interest in business at all. I can't. If that's the case, then you can start as vice president and get some hands-on experience. And you, Charlotte, you'll be Donna's personal assistant and support her. No! This is not how you want it to turn out. Dad used to love us both, but now he didn't even listen. Ugh, yes, Charlotte, my savior. She would surely know what to do. I can't believe it. I've tried so hard to prove myself, only to have everything given to a simple-minded fool like you. S simple minded That's what you really think of me? Well, I guess I just gotta take my new position to show her how simple-minded I am then. So the next morning, I dolled up and strutted to the company lobby under a different name, Miss Vice President. Huh, look at those gawking eyes wishing they could escape from the boring suits. Matthew was there too, and was he laughing? Suddenly, my heel got tangled up in my dress and I tripped over. What a disaster. Matthew offered me his hand and asked if I was okay. Who needs his help? And all the silly chatters? Just wait and see. And by that, I mean now. Matthew introduced me to the company's core members and announced some new strategic goals for the company. ROI, margin, accounts. Jeez, what kind of language is he speaking? After what seemed like an eternity, he asked if anyone wanted to add anything. Aha! Uh -huh. I, of course, couldn't miss a chance to show my leadership. This office is seriously lacking some colors. Violet blinds would be a good start, and some motivational pictures really help boost productivity. Oh, you mean putting up motivational quotes? Oh, please, no. Motivation comes from the all-time fashion greats. You know, Bella Hadid, Tyra Banks, Kendall Jenner. Everyone gawped at me while Charlotte furiously signaled me to stop. Everyone here is so boring! Ugh, all right, I'll stop then. My first day was then followed by tedious meetings and schedules. Everyone was talking gibberish and making me sign a bunch of papers. But every cloud has a silver lining, and for a foodie like me, that's dinner meetings. These people really know how to enjoy life, don't they? But before I could even have my first bite, they all started asking me about proposal this and project that. Fortunately, Matthew was there to save the day. Honestly, he seems pretty good at his job, and he's quite attractive when focused. Oh yeah, work. I gotta contribute my own talents at work too. So, the next day, I put the sign on my door, then sat back and watched my favorite fashion show. Ooh, look at those dazzling dresses. One day, I'd be walking the runway in a gown like that, not sitting here surrounded by confusing numbers and papers. Later, when I opened the door, an endless line of people was already waiting for me. Jeez, can't this company with all these brilliant brains function without me? Right then, Charlotte came dragging me away. What happened? Oh gosh, I didn't know that my computer was connected to the meeting room's projector, so everyone had been watching Project Runaway with me. Matthew was in the conference room too. Why didn't he fix it? Okay, everyone. We should thank our cute boss for giving us a lot of ideas for our problems. He finished the meeting and let them out, but Charlotte was still standing there fuming at me. Cute? There is nothing cute about it. Don't get any wrong ideas that he likes you. Wait for me, Maddie. What is with that attitude? Oh, right. I've seen the gooey-eyed look she gives Matthew. Does she have feelings for him? Before I could pry further, I was sent to Millen for another stupid meeting. Feeling bored, I watched a fashion show to kill time when someone startled me from my side. I personally think this collection is overrated. Oh, sorry if I scared you. I'm Brian. He then gave me his business card and, wow, 
He's the CEO of a modeling firm in France. Are you coming to the fashion week too? I wish. I actually came for work. <sighs> oh, what a pity. There's a modeling contest this week. I can tell a true beauty like you is destined for the crown. I missed so many chances to be on the runway. If I make it this time, maybe mom and dad will see how serious I am about modeling. This is too amazing of an offer to refuse. Brian, I'm coming with you. At the show, I made sure my phone was off so I could truly immerse myself in all the glamour of the newest fall collection. Brian then kept his word and took me to the audition. I was super nervous at first, but unexpectedly... Everyone else looked so amateur. Meanwhile, I strutted like a pro, confident that this time I would get an offer. But for now, reality was calling. <sighs> as soon as I turned on my phone, a zillion missed calls from Dad and Matthew popped up. This screamed trouble, so I quickly got Brian's contacts and returned home. There, Charlotte went all banshee shrieking mode on me accusing me of being irresponsible and selfish for skipping the important meeting. Dad, if you don't do something about this, Donna will destroy the company you've worked so hard to build. That's right. But instead of yelling at her, you should have been there to help out. I'm so disappointed in you, Charlotte. Oh God, Charlotte's face turned pale immediately. Dad should be scolding me, not her. Feeling a little bad for Charlotte, the next day I went to talk to her, but it sounded like she was arguing with someone inside. I walked in to see Matthew sitting there with loads of pictures of Brian and me. We're still, in Charlotte's words, it looked like we were dating. A few photos can't change the fact that we're getting engaged. He then grabbed my hand and pulled me outside, leaving a stunned Charlotte behind. How are you so sure that I'm not seeing someone else? It's just a feeling. Or maybe it's just my hope, because I... What did he mean by hope? And holy shrimp, why is my heart beating so crazy? What a day. I thought it was finally over when Dad slammed the pictures of me and Brian down in front of me. He was so mad at me, he decided our engagement would be tomorrow instead of a month, as planned. But I haven't mentally prepared for this. So here I am, at my engagement ceremony, waiting for my fiancé to arrive. Ha, <laughs> just kidding. Actually, Brian called me last minute to tell me the best news ever. A fashion brand had chosen me as their ambassador. I needed to fly over for some paperwork. Thanks to him, I successfully escaped the engagement and flew to Milan to meet up with him. Finally, I got to pursue my long-repressed dream in my favorite city and not pay heed to my dad's ridiculous orders. Yay! As I woke up the next morning, I eagerly reached for my phone to call Brian, but... Huh? Where was it? I looked at the nightstand, but my passport, my wallet, and all of my stuff had disappeared. I dashed to the reception asking for Brian's room, but they all shook their heads saying there was no one by that name staying there. Frantic, I used their computer and checked the website for his phone number, but it kept saying error. Then I looked up any information about the contest, but found zilch. How could he do this to me? I trusted him. Now I'm in a foreign country, all alone, and with no money. What am I going to do? I can't just call Dad to come get me. And neither can I call Charlotte. There's only one person I could contact right now. So I called Matthew, and he flew over immediately. We were walking along the Navili Canal to get some dinner before heading back. I thought he would be furious right now because I ran away from our engagement, but he was just quiet the whole time. So, is it okay for you to suddenly come here? I mean, work and stuff, you know? It's alright. You come first. Everything else comes after. That's sweet of him, but I needed to make sure he didn't get the wrong message. I called for your help, but that doesn't mean I want to get engaged. I'm... I'm not ready to come in. At first, I wanted this marriage to happen, but now I'm not so sure anymore. Oh my. Did me running away from the engagement upset him that much? As we stepped through the door, I saw Mom, Dad, and Charlotte waiting for us. Charlotte instantly bombarded me with her dolphin frequency yelling, saying how much they worried about me, how irresponsible and terrible I was. You should have won an Oscar for your acting, Charlotte. Unfortunately, your partner played you this time. Acting? And what partner? Turns out Charlotte was the one behind all of this. She hired Brian from the beginning to make me look bad in my parents' eyes. She also made sure my engagement with Matthew didn't go as planned. Everything played out just as she'd wanted, but she didn't think Brian's greed would get the best of him. He called Matthew, saying he was holding me for ransom. And during the call, the idiot fraud accidentally brought up Charlotte. We were all too shook to even speak when Charlotte burst out crying. 
You're right. It was me all along. She's never done anything useful yet got everything meant for me. Mom, Dad, if you needed someone to take care of the company and marry Maddie, why her? Why not me? You haven't told them anything this whole time? I was still processing everything when my dad sighed and said, I was going to tell you both when the time felt right, but seeing you pitting against each other like this hurts me so much. Actually, Donna, we're not your biological parents. Turns out, Dad was my parents' private lawyer and the company belonged to my real parents, not to Dad. But then, my parents got into a terrible accident, and during their last minutes, they gave the company, and me, over to him. They asked Dad to raise me properly and arrange for me to marry Matthew as a part of their deal with Matthew's parents. Growing up and seeing me so passionate about modeling, Dad was going to let Charlotte run the company and let me live my life how I wanted to. But then Matthew and his family showed up and insisted we get engaged according to the deal. Dad had no choice but to respect them and carry out my parents' will. So, my current beloved mom and dad are not my actual family? We're still... My biological parents had both passed away. Donna, we hope you understand. Though we're not related, we've always loved you as our daughter. This is very hard for us, too. I looked at mom and dad, the ones who had always loved and cared for me. Mom, dad, just like you two. I'm sure my parents would want me to do what makes me happy. Though I am the lawful heiress of the company, I can only do harm to it. So I hope you understand and let Charlotte take over it. She's a better suit than me. That's right. You cannot force someone into doing something they don't like. Neither can you force someone into love. Woohoo! No more boring office job. Instead, I've put all my energy into elite model look. And here I am today. You've got this, Donna. I confidently strutted down the runway with Mom, Dad, and Charlotte cheering from the audience. And when I finished my part, I joined my family and nervously waited for the MC to announce the chosen ones. Samantha Friske, Amelia Davis, and Donna Rossi! Yes! I've made it! I've been waiting for this day for so long! Suddenly, I spotted Matthew coming towards us. Congratulations, Donna. I knew you'd get it. Thank you for coming. I know love cannot be forced, nor should I rush it, but... Whenever you're ready. Donna, will you go out with me? How about... now? Dad, where have you been? I, I was so worried. Go away. Don't touch me. I froze on the spot, not understanding why my once kind-hearted father was being so cold toward me. I snapped out of my daze and tried helping him forward, but he flinched me away. My eyes started to tear up, I, and I didn't know what to do. Then another woman appeared. She quickly helped him up and smiled at me. Don't worry, sweetie. I'll take care of him. Excuse me? Who was she? My mother had barely been put in the ground, and Dad had already moved on? I couldn't watch any more of this, so I quickly left the room. How could things go downhill this quickly? My life used to be so simple and perfect. I had a loving family. I was always on top at school. People always complimented me on how I inherited both the beauty and intelligence of my mom and dad. But then a traffic accident happened and took mom away from us. Ever since then, my polite, well-mannered, loving dad changed into a cruel, bitter drunk who seemed to despise me. Ugh. The next day, I arrived home from school with the worry about what state my dad would be in. But, huh? Why was Uncle Alfred on my doorstep? I invited him inside, and there was Dad, slumped on the couch, surrounded by empty beer cans. As soon as he saw us, he slurred out and started throwing the cans at us. Uncle Alfred then took me to dinner so we could have a talk, and I couldn't help the tears as I blurted out how bad things were at home. He patted my arm and said, Your father's been through a lot. I think it's best if we give him time to sort himself out. I think you should come live with us for a while. So that's how I ended up living with Uncle Alfred, Aunt Madeline, and my cousin Charity. At first, everything seemed fine. As bad as it sounds, it was a relief to be away from Dad and to be able to properly process my thoughts for once. I was so grateful to Uncle Alfred for giving me a second home. But then he went away on a business trip, and everything changed. I was walking back to my room when Charity appeared in her doorway and tripped me up. As I stumbled and landed on my hands and knees, she snorted out, Yes, that's right. Bow down to your queen, you hideous peasant. You should know your place in this house. Ugh, that girl was such a pain. Since her dad went away, she wouldn't quit tormenting me. It's ironic that her name is Charity, but she doesn't seem kind at all. I'd had enough of her cruel jibes. 
This had just got personal. So I angrily replied, I know you're just jealous of me because your grades suck and you're not as pretty. Charity's eyes welled up. Then she shoved past me and ran to her mom. I followed after her and explained what happened to my Aunt Madeline. She frowned at Charity, then scolded her. Phew. Fortunately, I had Aunt Madeline on my side. Anyway, justice is served, right? Wrong. As it wasn't long before my aunt's attitude changed toward me too. One time, I was helping my aunt cook a casserole when the doorbell rang. It turned out to be an old friend of my aunt. As soon as she saw me, she happily said, Wow! It's only been a few years, but Charity sure has grown up. The older she gets, the more she looks like Alfred, doesn't she? Look at her eyes and smile. I stared at Aunt Madeline in confusion and saw her mood immediately shift. That night when I brought the casserole dish out, Aunt Madeline took one bite then spat it into a napkin. You're clumsy, thoughtless, and now an awful cook? Be a bit more useful, will you? I stared at her open-mouthed. Unable to find the words to say, then Charity piped in, Please, never make this again. Casserole is so gross. Just like you. Then she smirked at me as she dumped the entire plate into the trash. Weird. Didn't Aunt Madeline tell me to cook this because it was Charity's favorite? Ugh, it seemed like life in this house wasn't going to get any easier. Over the next week, their mocking and snide comments continued. One day I styled my hair in a different way, and Charity sniggered at me. What's that? It looks like you got a lobster on your head. <laughs> Have you ever considered dyeing your hair, by the way? Because blonde really doesn't suit you. On another occasion, I was invited to a party, so I put on this cute dress, but when I walked downstairs in it, they both stared at me. My aunt said, Oh, dear. Is that piece of rag making you look even chubbier than usual? Or is it because you've been so well-fed living with us? Another time, I was sitting at the breakfast table, dabbing lip gloss onto my lips, when Charity yanked it off me. As I tried to grab it back, she sniggered out, What for? Putting this on your gross lips just makes you look desperate. No one wants to kiss you anyway. Gosh, my patience with this girl was wearing very thin. Worse still, Aunt Madeline overheard the whole thing, but she just laughed. I didn't understand why they were being like this. I knew I wasn't ugly or fat, and far from it. I know I'm pretty, as I was always complimented on my glossy long hair. Well, until I moved here, anyway. This was so confusing. Why were they jealous of me? It turns out that being too beautiful was not easy. Ugh. Things got trickier when my dad, who's also the school principal, returned to work after his time off. He totally ignored me, and it made me feel terrible. <sighs> then I arrived home from school to Aunt Madeline fussing over me and asking if I wanted anything to eat. Huh? What? Oh, I see. Uncle Alfred was back from his work trip. Ugh. It was time I exposed this mother-daughter duo's fake act once and for all. So that evening, I volunteered to cook. Yep, you guessed it. I made the casserole dish. As I brought it out, Charity accidentally shouted, Ew! I already told you I hate this dish. Aunt Madeline turned pale, and Charity gave this gawping, shocked look. Then I dropped to my knees and pleaded, I know I'm wrong. Please don't punish me anymore. I don't want to sleep in the basement again. Uncle Alfred looked very confused, so I continued. I forgot that Charity hates this dish. I've been punished several times, but I still keep on messing up. I'm, I'm the one to blame. What is this? I go away for a few weeks and come back to carnage? He ordered Aunt Madeline into their room for a private chat. We're not even related. Don't expect my mother and I to be nice to you she said, then stormed off. What? What did Charity mean? Of course we were related. Aunt Madeline was my dad's sister, right? I wanted to know what was going on, so I hid behind the door and listened in on their conversation. Tell me the truth. Teresa is your child with Claire, isn't she? I was taken aback. Claire? My mother? Had I misheard her? I know, Mark told me. The day Claire had the accident, they ran some blood tests, and he found out Teresa's blood type didn't match his. Obviously, she's not his biological daughter, and she looks just like you. Now tell me, did you and Claire cheat behind our backs? You used to be in love with her before you married me. So Dad treated me like that because he found out I'm not his own daughter? And Alfred and my mom used to be in love bef before she got married to my dad? Explain to me! Enough!
Alfred finally spoke up. I have nothing to explain to you. Hearing footsteps toward me, I rushed to my room, closed the door, then crawled into my blanket, pretending to be asleep. Suddenly, I heard the door open. It was Alfred. Teresa, let's get out of here. I packed a bag and left with my Uncle Alfred. We moved into a small apartment not too far from his house. Even though he took care of me a lot, he never mentioned that day ever again. I didn't dare to ask either. So we just let it slide. He had to be my real dad, right? He just wasn't ready to talk about it yet. I tried to avoid charity as much as possible, but this wasn't always easy as we went to the same school. It wasn't like I was scared of her or anything. It was just awkward. Then one day, I walked along the corridor to see flyers stuck to lockers, doors, windows, and floating around the floor. They all had a picture of my face on them, and scrawled across them was, This fraud is the product of her cheating mom and a married man. Everyone was giving me dirty looks and whispering about me. I panicked and rushed out of there, but I wasn't looking where I was going and bumped straight into a jock, and standing next to him was Charity. Enjoy the fame. These flyers were specially made for you. Right at that moment, my father appeared holding a flyer. He waved it in front of her. What is this? Who allows you to trash the school with this rubbish? Leave Teresa alone. I couldn't cope with my father right now, so I ran off to class. That afternoon, I heard the school speaker announce that everything written on the flyers was lies and Charity would be in detention. Once the last bell rang, I just wanted to get home and hide away from the world. But as I walked outside, I saw my dad waiting for me at the gate. I had nothing to say to him, so I ignored him and walked off. Please, Teresa, at least hear me out. I stopped on the spot, then walked over to him. I guess it was time I found out the truth. So, turns out, yes, I'm not his daughter. But I wasn't Uncle Alfred's daughter either. I found this, and it made me feel so guilty, he said. He showed me an artificial insemination certificate file. Turns out after years of trying, my parents went to run some tests, and my dad was diagnosed as infertile. Mom didn't want him to be upset, so she secretly got artificial insemination and gave birth to me. It was never your mom's fault, and I was wrong to treat you like that. I'm, I'm so sorry. A fresh ran of tears streamed down my face with each word I heard from him. Teresa, I'm so sorry that us adults' selfishness and bitterness has hurt you. Startled, I turned around to find that Uncle Alfred was already there behind me. I guess he'd come to pick me up, and I didn't notice since I was talking to my dad. He must have heard the whole story. Alfred and I will do anything to make it up to you. Even if you want to find your biological dad, we'll try our best. I looked at him and Uncle Alfred thinking. There's no need to, as I've already got two amazing dads. This was my first ever day at high school, and naturally, I'm owning it. I mean, who wouldn't want to befriend someone as beautiful and friendly as me? By lunchtime, I already had loads of new friends, and everyone flocked around me to hear stories about my amazing life. I soon became super popular at school, I was the gorgeous, enchanting blonde beauty. Do you know what the best part was? Boys started noticing me too. Even the captain of the basketball team, Mitch, took a liking to me. It makes sense. I mean, obviously, the best-looking boy in the school is going to be interested in the best-looking girl. And guess what? He's following me on my way home right now. Stalking me much, huh? Just wait for it. It seemed like my new life here in this school was going to be awesome. Well, well, Mandy. That was not an easy question, but you answered it perfectly. Great work. See, I'm not just a pretty face. I'm also one of the smartest students in the school. My admirers grew and grew. It seemed like everyone wanted to spend time with someone as perfect as me. Here, I was telling my new friends about how at first, people sometimes misjudge me as I come from a well-educated and extremely successful family. My parents are super wealthy individuals who encourage me to always be the best version of myself and strive hard to never let them down. Hey, Mandy, pardon me, but how come you never wear designer clothes or use anything expensive? She looked down at my tatty-looking sneakers. I see why it might seem a little peculiar, but you see, I dress this way because my parents value the importance of being humble. That's also how I live. Goodness is better than beauty, right? 
Then I pulled out my phone and showed them the grades from my last school. Everyone gasped at me for being so excellent. I was loved, admired, adored. But of course, being this amazing meant that there's just gotta be quite a few kids being jealous of me. I mean, I suppose I couldn't blame them. After all, I dazzled like a diamond while they were just dull and ordinary. One time after an exam, as soon as the teacher left, this girl called Layla stood up and said, Mandy cheated. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it too. She checked her phone during the exam. Everyone was gasping in shock. Right at that moment, the class president, Marshall, shouted, Hey, he quit it. We all know Mandy's a great student. There's no way she cheated. Huh, that's what I'm talking about. Layla and Susan must be bursting with envy that their petty plan to ruin me didn't work. And the class president, hmm, he came out of nowhere to protect me. He must be another one of my many admirers. But sorry, Marshall, I'm way out of your league. A girl like me needed a handsome, rich, mature kind of guy. These boys at school are cute, but they're just boys. They're beneath me. One time I was in a rush and didn't have time to search my locker, so I accidentally took the wrong textbook with me to class. Seeing my mistake, Layla and Susan immediately jumped in. Uh-oh, what's this? We thought Miss Perfection here never messed anything up. I didn't even have a chance to say anything, as this Beth girl spoke up. He cut it out. Who doesn't make mistakes once in a while, huh? Here, you can share mine. Oh, wow. This girl was kind of nice. It was good to have an ally to deal with Layla and Susan. So, at lunchtime, I joined Beth's table. We started chatting, and she was clearly fascinated by how amazing my life was. Great, now I had a faithful sidekick. <laughs> Hey, Beth, help me do the homework for today, okay? Uh, again? I have to attend a very important party with my parents tonight. There will be politicians and plutocrats. I won't have time to do homework. Now I have to go home early to get dressed and do my makeup. Bye! I didn't need to turn around to see her funny, bewildered face. She looked like that every time I asked her to do my homework. But it was worth it. Right, Beth? She got to hang out with the hottest prodigy in school, me. So a little bit of extra homework was a small price to pay for such a privilege. You know, to me, that homework was nothing. I just didn't have time for it. I had to admit that having Beth around was very convenient. She made sure my grades stayed top of the class, leaving me time to play polo, go to the golf club, and attend charity functions with my parents. She also let me borrow her dresses, bags, makeup, and this super cute pair of high heels. My friends admired me, strangers idolized me, my teachers adored me, and I had a wonderful loyal best friend. Life was perfect. Until one day, as I was shimmying along the hallway, I noticed something odd. People weren't giving me their usual looks of adoration. Instead, they were turning their noses up at me. Huh? What was happening? Hey, Beth, do you know what's going on? People are acting really weird. She just shrugged. I don't know. Let's see. I tried to tell myself that it was no big deal, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was wrong. Then later that day, my worst fears were confirmed. As I entered the classroom, Marshall came over to me and waved his phone in my face. Good game, Miss Perfect. Turns out you're just a big fat liar. I looked at his phone and saw a long post with a lot of photos attached. There's a big title saying, The Truth About Mandy the Liar, and each photo came with a caption. Mandy's house is actually very ordinary. She lives with her grandparents. There are no luxurious mansions or wealthy parents. When Mandy just came to the school, she made friends with everyone bragging about her fame, fortune, and popularity. I don't know who she is, so what if we just shared the same path to the bus stop? Who said that I intend to get acquainted with her? Her transcript from her old school isn't even hers. She's just photoshopped her name on it. Every time she stood up to answer a question or take a test, she cheated, so she got a good grade. God, all this? 
How did they know? It felt like my heart had lodged in my throat, and my mind was spinning. My eyes blurred when I saw Layla and Susan approaching me. I stared at them in shock. Mandy, honestly, we don't hate you. It's just that we realized your stories were ridiculous, so we decided to find out the truth. That's right, but you sure did cover your tracks. We couldn't find a thing. Hang on, so who found these pieces of evidence? I did! Right at that moment, my so-called best friend appeared, followed by the homeroom teacher. Mandy, I know you think I'm some desperate wannabe you can control, but no! I soon worked out that everything you said was a lie, so I gathered evidence to prove it. Everyone was gawping at me with disappointment. I felt completely overwhelmed by the situation. This couldn't actually be happening. I pinched my arm. Ouch! It was as painful and as real as what was going down before my eyes right now. Beth continued. It's not good for you to live a lie like this. Who even are you? Ah! Reality images started flooding into my mind, making my brain feel like it was going to explode. I grabbed my head and ran out of the classroom. When I opened my eyes, I found myself in the hospital. The homeroom teacher was sitting next to me, and my grandparents were also there. They all looked very disappointed. Mandy, the principal was very angry and was about to expel you. But it was Beth and her friends who convinced him to let you stay. What? Beth? But she was the one who exposed me. Noticing my surprise, the teacher continued. After seeing your reaction, Beth realized that perhaps you had a psychological problem so she convinced us to help bring you to the hospital for diagnosis. I looked up at my grandparents. They were all in tears. Unexpectedly, I burst out crying. I longed so much to have a dream life full of fame, riches, and admirers that I drew a vision for myself in another reality. I was so absorbed in that illusory scenario that I forgot my own reality. This was last month, and I'm currently on medication for my delusions, and I'm also seeing a therapist. Right now, I'm on my way to see Beth, Layla, Susan, and Marshall. No, I'm not making it up. I really am meeting them. Oh gosh, there they are. This is scary, but it's something I've got to do. So I took a deep breath, then taking my therapist's advice, I spoke from the heart. Hi guys. Thanks for coming. Firstly, I want to apologize for lying. The truth is, I've lived the lie so much that I could no longer distinguish what was real and what wasn't. My therapist helped me see that this all began after I lost my parents. Part of my subconscious craved for this dream life so badly that I created a new one. This way I didn't have to accept the truth, which is that my parents have passed away and... I live with my dirt-poor grandparents. When I finished talking, I looked at them, half expecting them to shout at me or something, but... Instead, Beth smiled at me and said, It took a lot of guts to come here and say that. I'm sorry, too. I shouldn't have outed you like that, but I didn't know you were ill. Same. I'm proud of you. Me, too. Me, three. Now, when are we gonna order cake? <laughs> <laughs> So, what now? Well, I'm still taking my medication and talking to my therapist. I can now tell the difference between the make-believe and reality. Also, I'm back at school, and my teachers and classmates have all been really welcoming. Better still, I now have some awesome friends who like me for me. And you know what? It turns out that living in reality isn't actually so bad after all.